No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and we got one of my favorite people to talk to. We'll see if that still rings true by the end of this interview. <laughs> Van Lathan is in the building. What's up? What's going on? Adam, I'm concerned about you, bro. Yeah? Yeah. I figured this was going to be some sort of intervention. It, that's, it's an Adam Vention that's happening right now. I'm doing better than ever. How are you doing better than ever, Adam? Mentally, mm-hmm. I feel strong. I feel fortified. Right. On the mic, doing what I was born to do, I feel more confident and full of vigor yeah. than I've ever felt before. Right. I'm feeling good. You're feeling good. Adam, I'm concerned about you, bro. I'm concerned that, like, you really been on some white devil shit lately, man. Really? Yeah. What 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 moments in the No Jumper okay. Cinematic Universe got you to that conclusion? See, No Jumper Cinematic Universe, I actually feel like I came up with that. Because, mm. like, I feel like I, I I was so into the No Jumper verse, the No Jumper Cinematic Universe, because you got your whole multiverse. But You're right. Probably not true. No, but, but look, that was, there was a moment where I realized that, like, Andrew Schultz was very invested in our in what was going on here. And then there was a moment where I realized you were really paying attention, but to like a way more serious level than what Andrew Schultz Every knew. clip, every interview during the height of the Jumperverse. Because really, the, 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 the Jumperverse now is much like the MCU. Because mm. the MCU started and it built their whole thing up. Then they had Avengers Endgame where everyone fought. And then some people left the MCU and some people, now we got new heroes. For the record, never seen a single Marvel film ever. Well, I could so. tell you ain't got no imagination. You all <laughs> f- up. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't look like you would have that type of fun. That's too I, I hate wholesome. those movies. I've tried to watch them a few times. I don't get it. It's, that's probably too wholesome fun for you. You probably out there, just you want to out there with three legs, and that's yeah. probably your idea of I fun. Real, I can't. Well, so what's a real movie then? I don't know. I don't watch a lot of movies. You don't watch a lot of movies. Okay. Really so like I thing. said, you like I like you, documentaries. You like a different type of fun. Yeah, yeah. It needs to be real for me to get invested in it. Like you like like going down. You probably like tonight, Lena. What we're gonna do is we're gonna put flashlights on our head and we're gonna get all on K and we're gonna <laughs> go down to Skid Row and just like chill around and see what we can see and vlog about it. That's oh, no, I have like, very low risk tolerance at this point in my life. I would never do something like that. Yeah. Let me come back to the white devil. They'll thing, eat though. me alive down so there. So this is my thing, bro. You was always in your cool on your cool white boy, mm-hmm. right? And the cool Still white know. boy was was working. Mm. Now I'm looking at you, and it seems like you wilding a little bit, bro. Well, what got you to that conclusion? So a couple of things. Number one, uh, the the Ruger thing was bad, bro. Mm. That was yeah, bad. The- you, you, how did he? He's a grimy GD, that one. How, see, you throwing out people's <laughs> gangs. This is what I'm talking about. I got to keep it a thousand. This is the new Adam where you gang banging and you call. No, 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 no. I'm not gang banging. Calling out, saying he's a grimy GD is a little bit. Why? Why? Well, he knows. I know, but why? When he was here and he said straight up, mm-hmm. for somebody that comes from Chicago, because we did hip hop homicides, and I was there in Chicago seeing how things go. Mm-hmm. When he said he did not want to talk about beef, why did you press him? It almost looked like you wanted. Did you watch so- the interview? I did watch the whole thing. Right. How many gang related or op related questions do you really feel like I asked during that? Not that many. Yeah, like one or two. But he asked for zero, so why couldn't you oblige him? Right, that's insane. If he, if <laughs> if I had actually took him at his word right there, I would have probably just said like, all right, you you could just drive back to Vegas and not do this interview because Lil Durk, one of the biggest rappers, definitely the biggest rapper of Chicago, but one of the biggest rappers in America, had just done Academics' podcast, one of the bigger hip hop podcasts, mm-hmm. and in that, one of the premier questions that got clipped and put on Axe YouTube channel was. Why or how did you feel about Kanye doing this album and putting you and Ruga right. on the same thing, inviting you to the same party, the same show, et cetera? And Lil Durk had like a pretty involved answer where he actually acknowledged Ruga by name for I think maybe the first time ever, or at least for in many, many years. And to me, that was just an obvious question I had to ask Ruga. And we actually had a pretty decent conversation about that because that is just like the most obvious thing that you would ever ask Ruga and even Ak hit me up after like laughing saying like did Ruga seriously think you weren't going to ask that question because he said that he would have based the entire interview around that question because it's such an obvious question so my thing is like if you're going to be someone like Ruga who literally is dissing Lil Durk's friends and family members on every single song I mean not every song but probably more than 50% of the songs 
you can't seriously think that you're going to come in and do an interview and not get asked about the most high-profile rapper from Chicago who just discussed you at length on another very, very big hip-hop podcast. Now, the thing that I fucked up is that Ruga pulled me aside and had that conversation with me of saying, like, I don't know if I really like that episode. But his reason for saying that he didn't like it was he just said – he felt like maybe his energy wasn't on point. He mm -hmm. didn't say, you asked me too many op-related questions. That narrative started later. Now, what I should have said in that moment was like, okay, I'm going to hit you back because I thought that it was a really good interview and I think that we should drop it. What I did instead was I forgot and I just dropped it anyway because to me, I like the, the interview was good and there was just almost <laughs> nothing... <laughs> That like that narrative, the the op narrative, Stop that caught me by me, surprise. Adam, he didn't Adam, say that to me beforehand. Adam, and when Adam, you watch it, Adam, I barely asked him about anything. Adam. It would not have even made sense for him to say that that was the reason he didn't want it to drop. So so listen, this is why it's the white devil at uh, Adam twenty two right now. This is why mm. what you just gave right there is a completely salient, like obviously. Logical response. Logical response. Mm -hmm. But you left some things out. You know what we call that? We call that standing on business. There you go. Standing on business. Mm -hmm. Standing on business. Look at you now. See? Standing on business. Standing on business now mm -hmm. is what you're doing. Okay. Let me tell you. on it. Let me ask you a question. Did Ruga, prior to the interview, tell you that he didn't want to talk about that? Yes or no? He did briefly say that. Okay. So that's so, why so, I didn't. So, so, so let, I, I had hold on, 10 hold on, hold on, hold on. op related questions hold on. that I did not ask him because he said that. But the little Dirk one was like, you got to ask that but, one. but hold on, though. So that's the thing. The thing is this. Everything that you just said, as somebody who interviews people all the time, people in media, nobody's going to disagree with you. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know how many interviews have been pitched to me and somebody has said, either it be a label person or a PR person, hey, don't ask about this. And I'll say, okay, well, I don't need to have this person on. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if I can't ask about that, if you're going to come on here and I can't ask about that, I don't need to have this person on. Mm -hmm. Gets a little devilish when you say that you won't do it, and then they, you get them on the camera and you ask them about it but anyway. He did not specifically say he didn't want to talk about that. He just said well, that's what he, he said. He and he's a liar. He he did not say that he wanted me to do an interview that was entirely free of any beef related questions. He just said that he didn't want to make the whole interview like that. So for anyone, I, I challenge everybody watching this to go watch it and tell me if you think that that was an overtly beef-based okay, interview. So it might have been the interview, the, mo the least beef-related interview that Ruga has ever done in his life. In fact, I would bet money that it was the least beef-related, op-related interview he's ever done in his life. So if you're, telling, if you're saying straight up that he's lying, mm -hmm. then that's a different thing. But he says, hey... I didn't want so there's two points. He says, "Hey, didn't want to talk about any beef." Then he says, "He never said he didn't want to talk about any beef. He just said I don't want to do a ton of those questions." Okay. So I asked him about the most mainstream, well-known beef that he has addressed ten thousand times then, in songs. Then after that, you conveniently forgot. Right. There's no. There's not. That's not even halfway horns. It's like five inch. Horns. I should have like called him and horns. told him, "Yo, I'm dropping it anyway." Okay. What's what's with same end result. What's with the like? What's with the new bravado? You feel you feel different. You feel yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel different, right? Because you out here talking, you you telling people to slide. Mm -hmm. You doing all of that because you go through this time period in your life where you're listening to rap music and you're hearing all these dudes talk about what they're gonna do, etc. And I kind of had this epiphany. All I gotta do is call their bluff, and they're not gonna do anything. So I called. Multiple bluffs, and I raked the chips in. I'm a poker player. I raked the chips in because the reality is is that these are logical entities out here who, for the most part, behave logically, and there is not enough insanity lurking around in their brain for them to come do something physically to me. Now, if they would like to, I'm here. They're going to. Sure, sure. The, the come more, come like, do what, it, sure. What I'm saying is the more you invite that, uh -huh. the more that energy gets invited, the more it's not even going to be some, one of those guys. Mm -hmm. If you make yourself a trophy, somebody's going to compete for you. Well, that's I'm, the, I'm, I'm, here I am. <laughs> Standing on business, Van. I ain't worried about that. Fuckers is all talk. <laughs> Look at this.
is. They are. Look, 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 like look at so so Adam. What do what? And I, by the and way, and then they run and hide their hands after they fucking like after I call the bluff. It's like, oh, well, we're not going to – nobody's wanting to risk their freedom. Nobody's going to do anything. Okay, I'm not even talking about Ruger right now. I'm just talking in general. Well, not even Ruger. Right, yeah. Because I've just seen you – like, it just seems like you're running around with a different type of battery in your back right now. It's not even a battery that's in my back. If there is a battery, if there was any software installed in me, it's just realizing, like, you have nothing to be worried about. Right, because everybody's, everybody's pussy. I'm not saying everybody's pussy. For sure, there's some real ones out there. Yeah, I just don't know that I'm beefing with them. You don't. You don't think who? Or who are you beefing with? I don't know. Nobody really. So if nobody, you're not nobody beefing, doing nothing. So if you're not beefing with anybody, then you're not saying that anybody's pussy. But if you're saying that, like you're not, if you're saying that you have, if you're into it with somebody and they're not gonna do anything, then that's a direct challenge for them to do something. This is what I'm saying. Forget about all of that. Because I'm not a street nigga, and I don't, I don't think that you are either. Are you a street nigga? Because something might have changed. No, sir. You're not. This energy, where's all of this coming from? I think that there was like a long time in which I was receiving a moderate amount of hate. And in my brain, I started to believe like, oh, well, if you just, if you check the right boxes and you say the right woke shit or you say the shit that's not going to get people offended or whatever, then you can avoid taking more heat. Mm -hmm. Now, once this very large Marvel Cinematic Universe looking ass character, Jason Love, put his gigantic dick in my bitch yeah. and the surrounding media storm, mm -hmm. I think that made me realize that the job of a public figure, the job of a media person, of a, of a personality who's, who's seeking to make a career on YouTube or whatever, is not to minimize, minimize controversy. The goal is to live your truth in such a way that the people cannot look away. Okay. And I took so much heat from doing something that to me was a marketing tactic slash something that me and my girl really actually were just down to sure. do that it left me incapable of, fear, of feeling fear when it comes to other threats. I feel you. Okay, so there's a difference there to me. So the thing that happened with you and Lena mm -hmm. and the Jason Love thing, I didn't look at it as a big deal just because I'm a disgusting porn watcher, right? Oh, okay. So being a disgusting porn watcher, I know that there's Kissa and Johnny Sins. Mm -hmm. I know that throughout the history of porn, there have been couples in porn, mm -hmm. and the couples work with other people. The only thing that I thought was interesting was that y'all weren't doing it, and then y'all waited until after y'all married to do it, which is hilarious. You, <laughs> That's funny. I can I can because definitely understand why that was very that's funny. That's hysterical because <laughs> yeah. that makes it seem like somebody went, "I'll marry you if you let me fuck a black guy." Oh no no. no. Or either that you went, "I'll marry you if you fuck a black guy." <laughs> so, no, no, no. so in so reality, that, like, we have been talking about it. We, well, really, I've seen, we have been. I seen yeah. interviews prior. We to We have you. been planning the wedding for like well over a year. Okay. We maybe started having that conversation like four or five months before. The wedding, so it was, and to us, the and wedding. She, and she said, "I'll marry you, Italy. Everything's good." If like ten days after the biggest no, dick no, in no. the world, that was not part of this arrangement. That wasn't anyway. at all. No, no, no. It was not like a "I'll marry you" because this. Really, I was the one. I was the one who never thought that I was going to get married because, to me, I don't really see what's so important about it. I don't believe in God, and I don't give a fuck about the government. So for them to be signing off on some aspect of my life... It was important to it's her. It's whatever. It's more important to her. Now, the 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 thing with Jason Love, that's like a totally different plot line in our life. Because, I mean, keep in mind, me and her had already done... If my, if my goal was just to intertwine my life together with her so much that it would be very difficult to disentangle them, I mean, we already had a kid... We already bought a house together. We already got a business together. We already got accountants and, and, and shared employees and all this stuff. So why not take the traditional step and put your lives together? You're saying that that wasn't necessary to you, but it was important to her. When I even proposed to her, it was really kind of like the realization that this was something that mattered to her. That and, and especially it became crystal clear to me after we had a kid. Oh, I really am planning on spending the rest of my life with this person and really building a future together. And I started to realize too, that in her mind, 
she was always going to feel like she hadn't been properly honored as a woman and potentially because of her unless porn star status. Unless she No, unless she got married. Oh, unless I, was, I oh proposed to her. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was about to, okay. She, she <laughs> okay. probably wasn't, like, to her, that was important. So she wanted to be somebody's wife. I think, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, that's that's an important common. distinction in her world where she comes from a much more traditional conservative Armenian culture. I think that's that to me window, is kind of different. Conservative yeah. shit. And for sure, I am assuming that many of them know about this Jason Love arc and have not mentioned it to her or I. Sometimes I wonder what the conversations are like when we're not around. Right. Oh, the conversations are in Armenian, and they probably involve the N-word. But look, here's the— Oh, Lord. We could get into that. Like, here's, here's the situation. Never heard them say that, by the way. I, I'm, I'm sure that her family's beautiful and lovely. I'm fucking around. But yeah. th this is what I would say. Uh, one more question about that, because that was very fascinating. Oh, mm. the, the whole thing was fascinating. I, I knew, obviously, with the space that you're in, mm. that you know, letting somebody fuck your wife, that was going to be a, a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or not letting somebody fuck your wife, because I'm sure she has agency in what she's going to do, oh, yeah. but signing off on it. I worked with her on choosing the guy. This was a conversation between Did, so her and you, I. Let me ask you a question. So when you were choosing the guy that she was going to have sex with, was this a, we're choosing talent, or was this a whole, was this like, did you like look at the different dicks as well? No, I wasn't thinking about the actual measurements of the dicks. Because I'm asking. No, some it, people would. It was entirely based on who did the other girls in the industry that we know say is good to work with. Mm -hmm. And then also on top of that, who has a large social media following where it would actually stand out to people. Now, the resulting media storm was so gigantic that actually the social media profile of the guy involved really – did not matter. It right. probably could have been any guy. Were all of these guys black? No. How many of them were black? I think we had three names and two were black and one was white. Okay. Because you re realize that if like if you and Lena are looking for somebody for her to have sex with and y'all looking at like 10 black guys and like comparing their attributes, that feels like a fucking slave auction. <laughs> I oh well that's a good I didn't think of that. Yeah. But my <laughs> the thing is I feel kind of naive now. Why? Because I wasn't thinking, oh, it'll be way more viral if it's a black dude. Now, having just seen how this played out, I'm like, oh, shit, that would have been a huge wasted opportunity if we had had a white guy do it. Because the racial part of this storyline was a gigantic Obviously, part. America. But that didn't really occur I to me because don't believe you. I wasn't thinking about I, it like I, that. I do not you bro, this is another part of the white devil narrative. And see now you're making me feel even more naive bro, because I really me and I her don't believe you, can you scour my text messages. Bro, you let a nigga that looks like he plays middle linebacker for the Baltimore Ravens. He could not play for the Ravens. Don't give him that. Like like he looks this, Maybe a couple years ago. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like so it's like you don't think with what what as culturally aware and educated as you are, you don't think that your wife fucking that guy is going to be a much bigger deal than... A if, white guy. Yeah, the white dude. In retrospect, I feel like an idiot for not thinking about that. Okay. Last thing I'll ask about this, and then I'll come back to the actual point that I was making. Mm -hmm. When I was watching you and Lena uh, talk to Andrew Tate, mm. I saw that her mention that you had cheated on her. Back in the day. Back in the day. So in no way, the first thing that popped in my mind was she got to have sex with Jason Love because Adam cheated on her. Mm. And then she was like, fuck it. You got some other, so I'm going to go out here and do this. Was that a thing? I think the last time I cheated on her was probably 2018. Oh, so that's a long so time like, ago. It was so not like, like retribution so it's for over. that. I mean, you, that don't count no more. That's like, no, a, me and like her, a four-year thing. Her, her, and doing that was, her doing that was a business decision. There's a, there's a statute because like if you cheat and then you – if after four years it don't, it gets wiped off. It's not a thing anymore. Yeah, you know I mean, from my perspective, it's like I'm a dude, so I need to be given <laughs> many, many passes on the way into the relationship. Right. I need to be able to be a piece of shit as we settle our way into the relationship. You're going to catch me once or twice. Then I'm going to start to behave the right way, and I'm going to get my shit together. Now, having had this conversation with her, I realized that it really did hurt her feelings when I would cheat on her back in the oh, day. The lying joking, and everything. But like, it's, it's a huge betrayal and we've we've been there. We want to treat our women more honorably. Yeah. And, and, you know. So, and, and to me, when I looked at it and, you know, yeah, I had to deal. I actually said on the podcast, I was actually I was happy for you guys. I was, because I had heard her say before that it's something that she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You guys get to a point, you do it, it's y'all business, whatever, that's the business y'all in. 
I think that is you. I think that's your truth. I think this other part is actually not your truth. What, me acting boisterous? I think that's not who you are, bro. Really? I don't think so. I think the Adam that that you are is somebody is, I think the true you is the other guy, the guy who was trying to figure out how to solve problems, the guy who was there for the conversation. I think that's what's made you so compelling. I think this part, I think it has a shelf life. I don't think people are responding to it like you think they are. I think it doesn't feel authentic. I think it does. I think people are loving it. And even today, I think I've been people, talking a bunch I, of shit and people are going fucking crazy for it. Because you, the thing you is... Guys, you guys, in this fucking thing that you do, you, com- you confuse attention mm-hmm. with adulation. I think that if you, I think I'm getting both. I think right now, if you went out and shot yourself in the thigh, that people would be like, oh, shit, Adam shot himself in the thigh. Lie on no jumper. Everybody tune hmm. in. It's me, Adam, on some shit. I'm headed to see your side now. Let's see if I bleed out <laughs> before I get there. That's going up. Okay. But I think a lot of people that, were, that, that would be engaging with you would be saying, this motherfucker's stupid. There has been multiple times throughout this whole cuck arc that me and Lena have embarked on. <laughs> I call it the cuck arc, since I don't have to call it like the Jason Love BBC thing every time. I just call it the cuck arc. So there's been a couple different moments mm-hmm. where I either did something or thought about doing something that betrayed who I actually am or what I actually have going on. And one moment that I later on felt kind of dirty about was when I was having the conversation with, I think, Aiden Ross and... I said something about, like, Aiden, you know, we should really have a threesome, me, you, and Lena, yada, yada. And that doesn't seem like anything super out of the ordinary for the kind of conversations that I was having around that time. But later on that night, I felt kind of dirty about it. And I said to her, I'm like, you want to know why I didn't like that? Is because all of the other viral shit that I've said, when I talked about how much I love you and I love you so much that I was still okay with you doing this scene with Jason, et cetera, that was all real. I might have been saying it in a kind of ridiculous way. I might have been hamming it up and making it more trollish and and making it sound a little ridiculous. But at the end of the day, that is true. The thing with me offering up my girl is if we're going to have a threesome with Aiden Ross. You don't want to do that. That's a joke. And when I say it, though, the problem is is that people take that and think, oh, look, he really actually has no respect for his wife. So I decided that I wanted to fall back on that because anything that I say or do that betrays how I actually feel, I do agree, is not worth it. What has been going on recently is that after like six months of not doing any interviews, I finally went on Bootleg Kev and somebody finally asked me, how do you feel about these snakes in the grass that dipped out? And I gave them my reaction you and think I was just totally honest about it. You think it's fair to call those guys snakes in the grass? Oh, well, I think they know that. Why? Because they hung out until it was no and told me over and over and over that they were loyal and they were going to hold me down, et cetera, et cetera. And then when it came down to it, when they were at the point where they thought that it was finally going to be financially beneficial for them to leave, they dipped and they created a bunch of fake narratives that were completely not based on reality. And the, the fans out, out there, they know because they've seen how these narratives have flip-flopped and just changed over and over and over. And they're not really sticking to the original narratives. To me... That was why I consider it to be some snake shit, yeah. And I don't even think that they would really... If, if you had a real off-camera conversation now, with them... Now, what makes you think I have it? And, and, oh, you probably have. And if I You were know to, that I have. And if I were to see the conversation, I bet that I could point at it and say, look at right here. Look at how they basically fucking admitted it. All right, so let me tell you. Let's look at it like this. They did it because it was beneficial to themselves. They, they are incapable of identifying the disrespect or the bad treatment that happened that well, would justify not, them being disloyal to well, me. It was well, beneficial to them financially. Well, finan- well they true. thought that it was beneficial financially. Well, that's not financially. true because even I could see some things that I thought were disrespectful. Like what? Like, hold on. I'll get to that. I don't, pers- I, I don't know the business arrangement here at No Jumper. Mm-hmm. I do not know the business arrangement here at No Jumper. I don't know who was making what and what was happening and what was going on. I don't mm-hmm. know any of that stuff. What I do know, though, is, is that business arrangements normally come to an end. Mm-hmm. And when they come to an end, the people that are in business together have a decision about how that end is going to go. Mm-hmm. I was fired very very publicly from TMZ, right? Mm-hmm. Fired from TMZ because of what they said was a violent altercation inside of the office. I put mm-hmm. my hands on somebody. The way that was spun, everybody knows, everybody there knows it's not true. Like, okay. Everyone knows it's not true, right? Um, the way it 
what that told me, what that told me was that the relationship I thought I had with people, with certain people there, it was never real, mm -hmm. right? I feel like in the situation that you have with, I'm not going to say the guys because these are people with names, AD, T-Rail, Duno, everybody, Lush. And you've been going hard on Lush. You asked Lush for a fade. No, no, wow. I did? Did I? See, you don't even remember. I mean, listen. You don't see. You don't even. You're such. You're so gone. <sighs> nah, because I, that, you're that, on drugs. No, but like, you're so gone. You don't even remember. You asked Lush for a fade. I didn't like literally ask him in any kind of serious I way. I feel like you, like you asked. You no, asked yeah, run Lush the clip. Because I mean, I might have said that I would fuck him up or that I was capable of fucking him up. Why? But it was nothing where I was like inviting him. Like I didn't do the Flacco thing of like, let's go outside right now. I need that classic moment. Amazing moment. Because kind of awkward for me as a boss, but. Well, no, it's not. That's and that's another thing. But it was crossing a line. I know. All of that though, all of that is square on you. Everything and all of the stuff happened. Everything that happened, everything that was going on here, the politics that invaded the building, the fade culture that invaded invade the building. Nobody ever faded. Nobody ever. Fa they talked about it a lot. Somebody got their ass kicked in this motherfucker. Oh right. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I would call it a fade. Right. But. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that all comes back to you. You are the top dog here. You are the tip of the spear at no jumper. Right. And that was stuff. And even the way all of that stuff was happening, was going down. When I was looking at it, there was a point to where it seemed like that there was a lack of accountability or even a lack of willingness to have certain conversations with those guys. You have this business fosters an entrepreneurial spirit. Everything I look around here, everything I see, it all comes from your brain, right? Mm. People that are gonna, that, that are in here, anybody that's worth their salt in here is going to look at you and then going to want to say, well, damn, is there a way that I could do that? Is there a way that I could have my own brain? And I, the best fucking boss in the entire world, allowed everybody on the platform to start their own platforms and talk about No Jumper Business while they worked here, which... In retrospect, seems insane, but I Why? did allow that. Why does it seem insane? Because you know, as a person who works for a media company, that the likelihood of someone in your position signing a contract that allowed you to then go home and do a three-hour live stream where you talked about Bill, whatever the hell his name is, or whoever the fuck owns <laughs> The Ringer, it's just not happening. Do you, like, know who, do you know the name of the person who owns The Ringer? Bill Simmons, right? So why did you just pretend this white devil? Because honestly, I can't remember. Well, he's a white guy, isn't he? <laughs> I, I know, but... I'm not a sports guy. He's he's. It's just a name to I know, me. I, I've never watched his content. I don't know you. what the I'm hell he's doing. Go ahead, though. Um... I'm saying that the the agreements that I had those dudes in were, I mean, the most open agreements that you could possibly have. The other day I was having a conversation with Vlad. He said, anybody who works for Vlad, they sign a non-compete. They can't just go do a podcast where they talk about shit involving Vlad or his business, et cetera. And, you know, that was something that I had to learn that lesson the hard way. Sure. And I'll never have dudes in here who are doing that kind of thing again, but I did have to learn that lesson. Now, the narrative that they put out was that I was such a strict controlling boss that I, you know, I was just making like unfair demands of them. In reality, I was the most lenient boss that anyone in media will ever have. Okay. So a couple of things with that. Number one, for me, somebody who owns what I want to own and then it's talent where I want to be talent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have a production company. You guys all know, go stream two distant strangers on Netflix. we got three more movies coming out. We'll talk about that later. Won the Academy Award. That's a company that I own with Nick May and Trayvon Free, Six Feet Over Productions, right? Hmm. If you hear my voice on a podcast, it's talent. Like, sign to Spotify, sign to The Ringer, right? Mm -hmm. When I go into a deal, a talent deal, I have to know that the amount of money I'm being paid is worth not what I can say, but what I can't say, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you tell me right now that whenever you podcast or do video, you have to do it with us and you have to do it like this and you can and cannot say this. I'm going to take that back and I'm going to look at that because I'm somebody that makes money with words. And I'm going to say to myself, OK, cool. Well, if that's the kind of exclusivity that you want from me, that's this is the number you have to pay me. Mm -hmm. Now, at TMZ, I didn't do that. And the reason on, on my first contract, I didn't do that because I go from being a tour guy to being on television. And when I'm on television, I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Then there was one time where I wanted to go judge a beauty contest 
And they were like, well, you got to ask us. They don't ask me to do that. Right. But I'm saying, I know, but like anything, you want to do an interview, oh, you got to ask us. We got to mm. say, okay. And then by, the, by my last contract, it was just like, by this point, I had had a cachet there, and now I can leverage my influence to be able to do stuff. The point that I'm making is this. With those guys, anything that you don't tell them that they can't say, they're going to say it. So when and, – and they're going to go out and attack those opportunities. The question is, how do you deal with them once you see what they're doing is growing? I think what I thought, I think what a lot of other people thought was something that obviously isn't true now. I thought those were your homeboys. Oh, no, I thought that too. That's the problem. If you thought they were homeboys, why did you treat them like competitors? Um, Because they were literally competing for both the audience and – you know, the watch time that that audience would. You felt like that, but it actually wasn't true. No, what are you talking about? Of course it was true. If they're reacting to no jumper things, the audience has to have an idea of what's going on no, on no jumper to have any type of context for what would be said on back on fig or on something else. The fact that they were actually reliant on the content that you were made making. I'm glad you're acknowledging that. Since they basically right now are running no jumper reaction what, channels. But what, I, what I'm saying is the fact that that's what you're saying, that that's the deal, made them more reliant on no jumper and better employees than they ever actually could have or would have been. But you didn't really see them like that, and I still can't understand why. Well, basically what happened was I was the one who suggested that to AD in the first place, I was like, you should start streaming. I'm like, you could be like academics, but you know, maybe less messy, less gossipy, et cetera. You could play games. You could do all that kind of stuff. So he starts doing it. Now, a lot of different people from the No Jumper universe had at some point started doing streams or doing their own content, vlogs, whatever it is. None of them ever really had any sort of success that we looked at like, oh, that could potentially be a competitor for what we have going on. So it felt like it was just all good. You work here and you want to do your own podcast at home or you want to do your own streams and some of the time you're going to end up talking about No Jumper stuff, that's fine. AD quickly realized, and T-Rail quickly behind him realized, that the number one way that they were going to be able to get views was from stirring up shit at No Jumper and then going home and talking about it. And I quickly started to realize... How's that a loss for you? Because they were basically causing problems at the office between the employees and the other hosts. So you're and saying then, that they were intentionally but, but then, sabotaging No Jumper in order of in order to have content. That might be a little bit of a stretch since I feel like I'm speaking very analytically here, saying that they were intentionally causing problems, but they were definitely stirring shit up, and they have acknowledged this over and over and over. But then they would go home, and they would make the content about it. And so then, you know, I'm waking up in the morning and looking at it, and it's like, well, we didn't really even benefit from this controversy that you guys started, but then meanwhile, these are the biggest clips on your channel even to this day. So to me, at a certain point, that started to look a little bit less appealing. And I, I actually heard academics talking about this to AD the other day, and he said, he's like, for Adam at a certain point, he had to be wondering why he was allowing his workers to create competition for him. But then at the same time, I would have looked like a total dick if I started trying to tell them, hey, you guys aren't allowed to talk about this. It never even got to that point. Me telling AD that I didn't want him on the Tuesday show was the very beginning of me attempting to gain some kind of control over the intersection between the No Jumper content and the content they were doing at home. AD was already doing like four streams a week. I felt like that was not, you know, he was no longer doing anything of value on the No Jumper show. He's admitted that. I had that conversation with him and I told him like, I think that in terms of our friendship, in terms of us staying cool forever, because think this is a person who told me over and over and over, no matter what happens business wise, you're my boy. We are homies. Well, he didn't forever. just say that. No, he, he said that he showed out for you. Okay. That's arguable, but Nigga, he, he said that, you know, damn listen, well, listen, like, let me, let me get through this. He said that as soon as it was beneficial for him, he dipped out and he painted fake narratives about me on the way we out the door. And that that's all I'm saying is right. that he was loyal to me forever nah, until he just, saw that it was beneficial for him to be just disloyal. You just said you, okay, let me tell you the way it reads from me. Once again, we was all on a group test together, me, you, and, and AD, okay, and I. I think dead. you also need to understand that that's what these dudes do is they do you a little tiny favor. What do, who are these dudes? These dudes that we're literally talking about, not okay. black people. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. They do you a tiny little favor, right? What tiny little favor? Like keeping somebody off your motherfucking ass? Who? Nigga. 
Who? The dude, the dude who showed up here waiting to put something on your ass, and AD had to get, go out there and, and clear the situation. How much of a threat do you think that that guy was or is? I don't know how much of a threat he is to AD. All I'm saying. I know that he's probably a threat to this you. This is a well-worn pl- uh, page from the playbook of the L.A. gangster lifestyle, is you do a little tiny favor for somebody, and then you never let them forget, and you hold it over their head for the rest of their Depends fucking lives. Kind of favor. I'm just saying. Right. This wasn't even a favor so, and, that I asked and, for. And, and, and let me tell you. But something. now I got to hear about it every goddamn day, and other people so, in that universe are saying the same so type let of me, shit. So let me. So let me tell you what the difference is, and this is a lot of times where there has to be cultural literacy in these situations, right? Mm-hmm. In your world, that's not that big of a deal. In my world, I know what they're doing. Right. Right. And I'm very, very trepidatious about it. Right. I know all kinds of gang members. I move around and actually do work in the community, so I got to know where I'm going, and I got to know. Who's down there, right? Mm-hmm. For somebody to step out like that for you, unless you're getting extorted, like if, if unless you was paying somebody protection or something like that, unless you're getting extorted in not gang culture, not street culture, but in black culture, if somebody running here right now and they trying to fuck up Adam and I step to them and I drop my knuckles and get busy for you, mm-hmm. that says something. If somebody running here right now, I fuck with you, right? You don't got to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm going to be like, God damn. Adam, throw the left. <laughs> You're going to commentate? Like, I, like, I'm going to be like, Adam, Adam, get, get up, get him. You can film. You can get your World Star footage right like, there. Like, Adam, hey, nah, Bill, I'm, Bill, I'm going to get this. Don't I'm not, worry. I'm not on this. We don't do that type of shit over there. We be talking about movies and stuff. But you might now. I'm, like, I'm going to be like, Adam, You get Adam, that footage, you're going to talk like, about Adam, it. Adam, Adam, throw the left. If I get that if I get that footage, I know how to make some money off that footage. Right. But like, obviously, you know that. So, But what I'm saying is for somebody to do that, that demonstrates a loyalty, and I'm just going to be real. That demonstrates a loyalty and an actual affinity, right, for you, that they're putting their safety on the line for you. Now, you might not feel that way because you might be in a lot of different gang situations with a lot of different people who are extorting people and making and making them uh, feel that they're safe around them when they really aren't. But you're kind of falling for the rope-a-dope here. I'm not falling for the rope-a-dope. Because... You are are taking it and acting as if I was under any serious threat in that moment. Okay. When so, in the reality, Van, I was walking around the office that day. As soon as this threat approached, I was walking around looking like John Wick. I was ready to go out there and take a motherfucker's life. Yeah. I was happy to do it. I was begging for a body. AD went out there to protect guys, me from myself. We got He wasn't protecting Adam. me from milk. We got to help Adam. He was guys. protecting me guys, from what I was about Adam. to Y'all do. Y'all see this? We got to help Adam, man. I'm just saying. We got to help Adam. Adam, you got to I wish chill. he hadn't done that because then I wouldn't have had to listen to him tell me over and over and over but about look, how he protected me. But look, you just Which said, is, again, that's the page okay, from the playbook. Okay, you just said a second ago. You just said a second ago that... You saw their brand start to grow. Or you saw them start to do whatever they were doing, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you made the decision to take them off of, to take AD off of AD the off one show. Off one because show. Because I felt like he no longer had any energy or enthusiasm for the Tuesday show. Okay, so was it about the quality of his performance on that show, or was it about the fact that he had started a community? If he had done the community thing and continued to show up on the Tuesday show and do a good job, then I never would have probably wanted to have okay, that Okay, the narrative that you painted a second ago was that in some way community's existence necessitated you taking him off of the Tuesday no, show. No, it's because he would talk about every single current event, every topic, et cetera, and it would just be obvious that he was preserving his energy so that he could go home and talk about the same exact fucking things. And there was just too many times where I brought up topics on camera and got like a five word response from him. The glory days of the No Jumper channel and at the end of the day and everything else was when these dudes were coming in and had life and energy and they were excited to Bro, talk about some shit. Some of this shit got me through the pandemic, man. I was watching that, this shit but, but all But I'm the time. saying that energy and enthusiasm went away as time went by. Now you think that that energy and enthusiasm it went got away. transferred to their channels. Okay. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. All right. The death of No Jumper or that version of No Jumper started happening way before they actually left. Okay. Because as someone who was really paying attention to the view counts and the level of enthusiasm from the fans and having to read the Reddit and read the comments and realizing how unhappy the fans were with how lazy the content had gotten, that's that's where my motivation to switch things up came from. But you're looking at you're looking at it through a specific purview, right? Because I could say that all of that might be true, but at that same time. We had the cocaine bot era, 
and the freestyles and all of that stuff, which was some of the best content. Mm, it was a little try hardish, don't you think? It was fucking hilarious. What the fuck you mean? It was it was a bunch of rappers that all in the same place rapping against each other. And through this entire time, just to let you know, I wasn't impressed. It, you weren't impressed, but no, it was, I wasn't too enthralled but, but by that arc. The the reason why you weren't enthralled is because what this is really about isn't really about them being your competitors because you're saying that they're not your competitors now. You're saying that they can't compete with you now. Mm -hmm. you, that's what you think. Well, they react. Okay. And you did you and they couldn't really compete with you there. Really, Adam, this is and now about your ego. No, it's about me wanting to make the kind of content that I really think is important and has legs. Now, when motherfuckers start doing races in the parking lot, and now, oh, oh, next content arc, where we're gonna have a jumping jack contest. Oh, we're spitting freestyles against each other. I gotta listen to what Lush rap as part of my job. What, oh what, my what, god, what, 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 that to me, bro, I wasn't into it bro, anymore. Bro, so what, I kind of, I bro, took a step back. Bro, what are you talking about? Like, what, what kind of groundbreaking? No disrespect. What kind of? I've seen, people have gotten their ass eaten on No Jumper. People have like got. And I'm telling you that that was some good content. You're, you're I will take. So Crip Mac eating a black bro, woman's bro, ass bro, any bro, day before I have to listen bro, to lush you are rap. So full of shit. What what is the what is the difference okay. between having Man. somebody? I've literally seen videos, and shout out to all the ladies that come through No Jumper and get busy. I've literally seen videos of fucking what's the crazy dude, the racist dude that you do the podcast with? He races his shit. John Zerka. Nah, fuck nah, Danny I don't know Mullen. Who that is. Um Danny Mullen. That guy, right? I seen him in here with his homeboy one time and what, what, what was popping in here? Somebody was getting their dick sucked or they was trying to fuck Kazumi or some shit like that? Didn't that happen? Danny that Mullies. did happen for the Patreon a long time ago. But, Vance, this is the so thing I'm that I think you, you're forgetting. Like, what, 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 uh, the, 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 having a freestyle battle is way more wholesome and significantly less out there than some of the other things I've seen on No Jumper. You wholesome can't, and boring. Again, you don't it understand. Wasn't boring. Everybody was watching. You don't understand how bad the energy gets when the employees have to listen to Lush rap. And I have to listen to Lush now rap. Now you just dissing Lush. That shit just, it's not good for the soul. Lush gonna beat your ass, bro. Okay, I, I invite that. Anyway, <laughs> Van, this is the thing that I don't think you're giving me credit for. Okay, tell me. When you look at me. When I look at you, okay. You might not realize this. I think, I think you do realize this. I am one of the best hip-hop adjacent podcasters. Yeah, because you're not a hip-hop podcast. To have ever existed. Some of you're, my interviews under my belt yeah. include... The most viewed rapper interview in the history of YouTube that I did within the first year What's of me making YouTube rapper content. Interview? X, 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 Tentacion, rest in peace. I say that to say. How many views does that have? I think it's about 22 million. So, I, so Takashi 6 9 on the Breakfast Club doesn't have more views. That's the that? only one that's close. Is 6 9 and Soldier Boy on Breakfast Club? I'm not 100% sure on which one has the most views, I but last I time I looked. It had more than both of those. Okay, let's look at it right now, cause like, let's do if it. you're gonna talk your shit, make sure that this shit is real, cause I know. That if these... it's not number one, it's in the ballpark. That's right. all I'm saying. Right. I did that in the first year of me doing now, content. Can I ask you a question. Now, now hold on, hold on. And, let's and, stop. And, and let's, even let's, beyond that, let's, let's stop right now. Thousands of other interviews. <laughs> I am one of the goats doing this. Okay, okay, let's let's stop and right I'm now. And I'm one of very few Caucasians on the list. When I bring people you can on, say crackers, okay. I want like, them it, to it, in some way embody that excellence of conversation so, that I have been bringing so to the table you, for the last 7 years, so, 8 years. So, you did an interview with X, right? Yes. It, would it be fair for me to say that that interview was such a big deal because of X? And not because you're such a singular talent. I'm not, you're good. You're okay, but I am a singular talent. But then also <laughs> on top of that, X, I'm someone who was able to recognize his greatness Fair enough. when he had 15,000 SoundCloud Fair followers enough. before he became one of the greatest or biggest talents of our generation. Kid I say all that talented. to say, Kid was very talented. We produce incredible content out of here. Okay. I'm not and so you know. for me, at a certain point, when the content becomes about listening to lush rap, that's when, for me, it's like, okay, this, you know, I, I want to be the one controlling the destination of this ship. So I got to be able to make calls at a certain point. And, you know, for me to say, hey, AD, you've been on the Tuesday show for the last two years. It's not working out. I think we got to do something different. I need to be able to make those calls. So the, fa the fact that they all ended up leaving as a result of me wanting hey. to make one tiny change about the operation that we have going on here. I don't think it was really about that. that that's fine by me because like you, I need to reserve the right to make those kind of calls. You made a lot of money. 
you you have a very successful brand and move the culture and and, and massively. So. How have you moved the culture, Adam? I've interviewed. I've done interviews in the infancy of a lot of the most important artists who have come out throughout my time doing these conversations. I've done the interview for a huge percentage of so them. You, so, and so, still on a consistent basis, I so do interviews when, when you say, with people that move the culture and create massive conversations that everybody else has to react so to. So when you say move the culture, uh -huh. what culture are you talking about? Well, whatever. There's many overlapping and intersecting cultures. Right. Because I really, do you know what I think? I think No Jumper actually has, and I, this is a, a testament to you, I don't think No Jumper is a hip-hop platform. I don't. We're bigger than that. I, I think that No Jumper We're largely hip hop. I think that No Jumper is. On. I think No Jumper is a, a pioneer in what I call WIC, weird internet culture, hmm. and that's a that's and that's not a diss. That's a combination of hip hop, gang culture, tattooed white boys, porn, all of that. There's actually no platform like No Jumper. Except Everything that no I'm Jumper. interested in gets thrown in the gumbo right. pot. Right. So ev there's no platform like No Jumper except No Jumper. Cool. I I I personally don't think that I I don't think I don't think that when when you say move culture and in interviews that move culture, I wouldn't think that I would look at No Jumper as a place that moves culture. Entire internet is talking about this gay crip right now. But, but, I didn't even have but, but, anything what, to do what, with what, what, what it. Rick what, Baby and Crip Max sit down like, with him. Like, it sparked a I, massive I know, conversation know, about like, homosexuals and gangs. I, I know, like, bro. Like, I helped orchestrate that, but, even though I but, didn't know it but, was happening. Bro, but, like, I just be honest with you. Like, I, talk your shit, but no. Yes. Like, it, it, not, the whole internet is not talking about that. And that's oh, no that's shade. huge. And you, that's you, not, oh, you're on a different part of the internet. And, and, and that's not a shade to, to Brick Baby. Because I will say this. You do have a good eye for talent. Because mm -hmm. when people come in here, and that's just real. When people come in here, when I'm watching Brick Baby, and I'm watching, uh, what's the what's the brother that's with Brick Baby when you when you interview? Like, excuse me, the, the guy that sits sometimes and he's with Brick Baby. It's you, Brick Baby, and it's another guy that I see with Brick Baby sometimes. Am I tripping? I don't know. Like a, like a darker skinned guy. Dub, the, okay. uh, dub, right? When I okay. see those guys, I'm thinking about. I'm not. I wasn't thinking about the No Jumper show, okay. right? But when I think, when I see those guys, the guys that come in here and normally sit down and do their thing, like it's dope. Like I always see. Oh, Adam knows how to spot someone that's good to even come. In, like Flacco, like you. There's something about Flacco. Flacco has something to where you're like, oh shit. And a lot of times, Flacco be having trouble. Getting this shit out, but you still stick with Flacco. There's something there. So I'm not saying you you're not talented, but I'm saying like when you say I am one of the greatest hip hop podcasters ever, like you say you're the greatest hip hop podcaster. I wouldn't say the greatest. That's that's a lot. Okay, so who who's in the? Give me your top five hip hop podcasters. Current? We got to do current. Nah, just just all time. Oh, well, okay. Vlad's got to be in there. Okay. Uh. I am hesitant to throw Ak in the top five because as I feel like he's incredible at what he does. He's very, very good. He's he's somebody I look up to in terms of the but art form. But not traditionally a podcast. Well, he just he's only been doing it for a couple of years, so I feel like maybe. Okay. But but I do I have to put him right up there. Um, you know I do look at Joe Budden and Charlemagne, uh, even though I don't think of Joe Budden as an interviewer, and I don't think he's necessarily the best interviewer. But, but we didn't say interviewer. certainly what he's built as a podcaster. You got to give it yeah. to him. See, even the fact that you would hesitate to, like, even the fact that you would hesitate. Well, because when I'm talking about Joe academics as a podcaster, I'm talking about him as an interviewer. Right, and it's more, and it's about more than you're that, right? Because, right? because, a lot of people watch podcasts. Most people that watch a podcast, they're coming back for the personalities well, and not for interviews. Most of the time, when you talk about podcasting and rap, at least you have interviewers and then you have hanging out with the homies, talking, or not the homies, but the co-hosts. You know, right? So Joe's like very, very much the king of. Hanging out with the homies, talking, right. right? But as an interviewer, Rory and Maul doesn't make there. that a huge part of his brand. R Rory and Maul will, will be in there. Top you. five? No, I'm asking you. No. Okay. So who is a, who else is in the top five? So it's you, Joe, Charlemagne, Ack. Who else? Who's fifth? Mm. Gilly, Wallow and Gilly. Mm. I like those guys. You think you're better than Gilly and Wallow? I like them. I respect what they're doing a lot, but it's not my favorite podcast. Okay. Do you think that there's parts of Gillian Wallow's podcast that maybe you can't relate to? Because maybe yeah, it's sure. just a little bit there's, too yeah, there's a familiar lot of, to us? There's just a lot of like affirming 
the subject's statements. It's a lot of like, yeah. It's just not, it's not, <laughs> this to me, it's like, I like to get to the <laughs> Bro, snappy guy, questions. No, you, know, you know what it is? You know what it is? Do you like drink champs? Got a huge amount of respect for Nori. Do you like drink champs? See, you, you, you can't not talk your shit. Talk your shit. I have a huge amount of respect for Nori. But is he my favorite interviewer? Probably not. Do you know why? Why? Because they're not messy. Because they get people on there and they get to the center of people's stories. They talk to people. They celebrate people, right? They get to the center of it. When you watch Gillian Wallow. I can Wallow, give you a much more nuanced when, critique when you, off when you, camera. When you, when but you, I refuse to disrespect people that I have huge amounts of respect for. But what I'm telling you, sometimes, like when I watch... When I watch Nori and them, and a lot of times, to be honest with you, these are not hard-hitting interviews, but these interviews are full of joy and life. And when Wallow does have to relate something to somebody or Gilly does have to relate something to somebody, who they are culturally and the power that they have from their experiences, it always resonates with who they're talking about. They're not going to get nobody on their podcast and ask them who they beefing with or which body they took down, or how many ops they're going to kill on Saturday. They're not going to do that. They're not because they have a cultural edict to be able to talk to these brothers in nourishing ways, right? So, like, I don't expect you to like that, but I, it's really interesting that you have a problem with a podcast that really— Don't drag me into this beef. I don't have a problem not, with them. I'm just talking about who I Fair personally enough. think Fair are enough. the that's, top oh, five cool. podcasters. Who was the first name I said? I said Vlad. Right, Vlad to me does the best job of getting to brass tacks. You know, he's a good he interviewer. Just, yeah, he's, he's I go on there all the time. He's meticulous and detailed and informative, and that is something I aspire to. Mm -hmm. Every time I listen to a Vlad interview, there's usually a moment where I'm like, "Ooh, that was a fucking ill question right there. That was a perfect <laughs> question <laughs> that good. he just asked." He's, I don't he's, know he's if, incredibly well researched. Sometimes as well. it's his his research team is probably helping him put together these questions and stuff like that. But I have a huge amount of respect for. Let me let me ask you, you know, this. there's a thing that people do on podcasts a lot. They'll be doing an interview. Let's go outside hip hop. You know, I just drove to Palm Springs and back. I listened to a four hour Joe Rogan and Post Malone interview. Okay. This was the most normie ass interview I've ever listened to in my fucking life. There was not one moment where Joe Rogan asked Post Malone anything that was specific to what it is like to be Post Malone or what it is like to be one of the most successful pop stars in the game. To me, that's kind of a waste of audio, of time. You know, they're having conversations about, oh, AI is crazy. They're having conversations about, um, you know, hunting and about, you know, all these be, different I'll things. I'm Post Malone. You interview me. You're Joe Rogan right now. To me, I, I let's, just... Let's do it. Like I'm Post Malone. Let's, and I'm Joe Rogan? Yeah, uh, I mean, while I'm <laughs> hold on, I'm Post Malone. Hold on. <laughs> while I'm watching it, I'm thinking to myself of all the questions that I would ask Post ask Malone right in now. that moment. To me, they had like a great four and a half hour like bro down. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like I want to ask Post Malone the things that only he can answer in the best context that I can. And Joe Rogan clearly is not someone who gives a shit about that. He's perfectly happy to let Post Malone ask him about archery for 45 minutes. Well, I mean, I, I respect that. Well, well, That's look, just not what so I want to do. Something else with, 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 with Rogan's pod is that Rogan essentially does a pod where he, a lot of times he has, he obviously he tailors the podcast to the interviewee, right? He has asked some questions, but a lot of times the person that's coming on the Joe Rogan podcast is essentially a guest host of the Joe Rogan podcast. Mm -hmm. It's them going back and forth. And that's a different thing too, like because you you have people that you interview, right? To where you're trying to dig and get to something, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you 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 have people that you come on there and they basically bro out with you as if they're on the podcast all the time. Mm -hmm. Joe's audience comes to the podcast for Joe Rogan. So really, he doesn't have to ask Post Malone anything. He can go. He can bring Post Malone into the Rogan verse and ask Post Malone about Biden or the ivermectin or any of those things, and his audience is gonna like it just fine. Mm -hmm. Like with you, there was a time where it was becoming like a, and I think now because of the 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 whole cuck era or whatever you want to call it, I think people are more interested. I mean, you said it. I don't. I wouldn't. Once again. I think it's a regular thing that porn couples do. But because of that, I think people are more interested in you. But I also think that you're more of a um, of a B-side interviewer like Vlad is. Vlad talks back to you more now. But when you're on Vlad, one of the things about going on there is this really about you when you're on there. Mm -hmm. It really is about you. 
Vlad will go back and forth with you a lot, but Vlad, gonna, Vlad asked me questions about my sister and all of that stuff. So I, I think that that's probably a little bit different in terms of the way he would interview a Post Malone. This is, what, this is the whole point. Like, when you say move the culture forward, I'm curious about what you feel like your responsibility to this culture is. Because when I think about move the culture forward, when you talk about something that makes a lot of noise, everybody is one crazy snapshot, crazy uh, fucking incident. Like, we had Emmanuel Acho on the podcast and me and Emmanuel Acho go back and forth because Emmanuel Acho is Nigerian and I'm whatever, and it's in the New York Post, right? It's a, a, a who is that? Emmanuel Acho is a he's a sports commentator, right? Okay. So he he's on there, and me and him start going back and forth, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's in the New York Post, and everybody's talking about it, blah blah blah, um, because he's on Fox, he's on Fox and stuff. Uh, so you're always one interaction away from having something go viral. When you say move something forward. There's like an intent there. Like when you say move something forward, that that means that there's been an evolution of thought or discourse because of something that's happened on your platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that that hasn't happened, but I'm saying that is a lofty goal for any platform. Crip Mac is a homophobe with Hoover Killer tattooed on his forehead. <laughs> And we got that motherfucker to sit down with a gay Hoover Crip. Motherfucker looked like he's supposed to be a hairstylist. And they talked for an hour, and Crip Mac had a good conversation with him. And I does do I think that's moving the culture forward? I'm sure you would agree that uh, normalizing uh, non standard well, it depends on what happened, right? Relations because is I don't think important that in hip hop. I, hip hop has a very retrograde, act, uh, you know, perspective on homosexuality. Right? I think that. I, I think that that's sometimes overstated, but I'm not going to fight that. Okay. But what what I what I would say is what I would say is, like for example, did the Richard Spencer interview move anything forward? Mm, I do think it it definitely moves something forward. How I so? feel like well, it was a great conversation. People fucking loved it. I still hear people asking me to have him on again all the time. Have him on. I think people were excited to hear him and Destiny have a conversation. And uh, Wack, I don't know if you know this, Wack's been pushing me super hard to have some of his uh, black Hebrew Israel like friends do a debate with Richard Spencer. Haven't got a DM back from Richard about it in the past couple of days, so I'm not sure if he's ducking that fate. Or I'm sure he's got a very complicated personal life as well, so there's probably some <laughs> decent reasons for why that might be the case. But yeah, being a fucking Nazi, yeah, it's probably he probably has a complicated former personal Nazi. life. Okay, so what has <laughs> so what is what has Richard Spencer done? To you, right? For, for you, like, what has Richard Spencer done to, to, uh, to prove to you that he's no longer a white nationalist? Um, he sat next to me and he said that he thought that racism was a useless uh, thing to try to evoke if you want to, you know, change the world. But what did did he give you any inclination as to why he came to that? Yeah, I mean, you said you watched the interview two times. I, I mean, did. it definitely, I think that realizing that yeah, Trump I, was I, a charlatan. And I watched the interview two times. Realizing that the liberals were right about a and, lot of stuff. Uh, I watched the interview two times. Liberal and conservative has nothing to do with white nationalism. There are plenty of white nationalists. There are plenty of, there's plenty of white supremacy. Plenty of white supremacy on the left. You know Not a lot of thing. Democrats who identify as white supremacists? I don't know a lot of Democrats who identify as white supremacists, but I know a lot of Democrats who are white supremacists. But that's different than the Republicans who pretty much identify as white supremacists, it, right? That's different than a specific... Listen, when you talk about white supremacy, like, there is both the identity of white supremacy right. and then there's the framework of white supremacy. I think and one is very mysterious and vague and hard to pin down, and one is an actual identity no, that no, no, people no, no, no. claim on, to identify on, with. It's it's vague to you because you're white. To me, I recognize from number one my cultural experience, and also from what I have endeavored to study, I recognize the pinnings and the undergirdings of white supremacy when I see them. And to and to be real with you, white supremacy in America is not the shark; it's the ocean. It's like the right. actual C, right? So, so like white supremacy and that whole thing, it exists everywhere. Not one side of political thought has ha, has a, a patent on that or has a monopoly on that. It's just the way it goes. Now, to your point, in real life, there are a bunch of people that go, "Hey, I hate niggers." Right. I am, a, and he was one of those. 
My thing with the interview. I don't think he ever used that word, did he? Um, he, he may, he may. I'm sure he's used it at some point, but I, he, I haven't heard him use it. Uh, and, and I don't want to be holding water for Richard Spencer for the record. Which I just, I, did. I do think that he has been smeared in a lot of ways related to this conversation that are unfair, despite the fact that nobody seems to think that he deserves to be treated fairly. So I, I'm not treating him unfairly. This is what I'm demanding because I live in a country where this has been demanded of me since I was born. What I was demanding is this. Okay, if you're Richard Spencer and you start the alt-right term, you literally invent it, 2007, 2008, right? Mm -hmm. You go on to find found the NPI, the National Policy Institute. Um, you go on to have a burst of popularity when Trump gets elected president. Mm -hmm. You're everywhere. You organize the Unite the Right rally where Heather Heyer is killed. Someone actually died in that, right? So, well, 10 people died at Astro World too. Right. Okay, so what? I'm saying that he Richard Spencer was as involved in her death as Tra as Travis Scott was in the death of all those people at his concert, right? What about ism? Classic white devil move. But let me you, when like, you like, say like, that, like, people like, at home think that he drove the car classic, and he ran her over. Classic white devil move. What I'm telling you is right now is the Astro World is a concert, right? right? Astro World is a concert where a lot of people got together and it was handled improperly. Mm -hmm. The Unite the Right rally mm -hmm. is a protest with people with tiki torches who are out to make a point about what they think is happening in this country. They will not replace us. It is a white supremacist, white terrorist action, okay? And Richard Spencer was the leader of that. He was the leader of spreading hate crimes went up 17% when Trump was elected. This all of this stuff, it was real. It was actually real. But if a deranged person shows up at this rally and runs somebody over with their car, all I'm saying is that it's kind of hard to put that on him, right? Not to, not for me. It's not hard for it's not hard to put it for me because to me, th what I look at is if I get a mob of people, if I if I get a mob of people, right? If I say, "Hey, we're going to no jumper right now. We're going to no jumper right now. We're going to no jumper right now to to fuck up Adam or to to fuck up Brick Baby or to fuck up whatever, and a mob of people show up right there, and I get everybody all whipped up, right? Really, for no good reason, by the way. It's not like a situation to where someone had been killed. There's no justification for this other than racism. Mm. And then we get there. The resulting carnage that happens from that, especially because it's wrongheaded, is definitely my fault. But let's say that, let's absolve Richard Spencer from that. We don't want to hold him accountable. That's fine. What I'm saying is, he has a decade and a half track record, mm -hmm. nearly, of being a white nationalist, a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. Only in America can someone just go, I was wrong. So what kind of conversation do you think I should have had with him? Because to me, the conversation the we had was a conversation in which he told me that he no longer thought that race was an effective framework by which to you know, do politics. And I said, okay, let's talk about it. Yeah, I watched him in the interview. And by the way, I watched him in the interview. And I was happy to do the interview thinking that he was still a full-blown racist. I get it. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's I mean, also you, worthy of a conversation. Even if sure. he is like a Nazi right now, I am a Nazi. We can still have a conversation hey, with him, right? Hey, look, I, I don't like I don't have a problem with that. Mm. I don't have a I'm not I, I'm not precious about I'm not precious about like who people talk to. Mm. I am precious about how they talk to them. So I'm not precious about like Nick Fuentes has been up here. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that was a Zoom call. <laughs> well, I'm just saying he ain't been in here. Oh, okay, but yeah. you, you've you've had Nick Fuentes mm -hmm. on, like all of that stuff. I don't. I wouldn't have a problem talking to any of those people. It's not. I'm, I'm not like I had Josh Denny on my shit. Josh Denny, me and him go back and forth. Like I've talked to whomever. It doesn't bother me. But there was an incuriousness about his change that I thought was, um irresponsible i agree with you on that i think that the problem was that both destiny and i were a little bit more intrigued by him claiming to be a democrat him claiming to support biden and him claiming to be supportive of ukraine mm -hmm. that that kind of got in between us putting enough of the interview into the why are you no longer racist word up conversation do you see though how something like that directly cuts against an idea of any sort of culture existing here or any sort of culture that exists black people. Cause you have a, a place full of 
black employees, right? And this place, as you've already said, and it's your prerogative, it runs basically off your your interests and what you feel is is relevant to talk about. Am I to believe that you feel no responsibility to the culture that you have benefited from? If you let's say that this is not a hip hop platform, whatever, it's certainly a platform that has gotten its rise. You say your biggest interview was ever was with X. That's a black person. That's a black kid making music about his experience growing up in Lauderdale, right? Mm -hmm. A black place. So you don't feel any responsibility to that. Because if I look at the Richard Spencer interview or even how AD and T-Rail and the rest of them were treated, it seems like the cultural responsibility of No Jumper is something that you don't think about. Is that fair or unfair? That is unfair. Okay. I think that the problem with me is that I'm the type of white guy who's in hip hop, interested in hip hop, around rappers. Rappers seem to have, be kind of drawn to me. They like having conversations with me. I seen you in the Juice World documentary. But I'm not the type of white boy who's just begging for everybody to like me. I'm actually out here being myself and I'm not modifying or augmenting my personality to make people appreciate me more i'm just really being myself so Word. that was probably the problem is that i was having that con conversation with richard spencer and i was actually asking him the things that i was interested in keep in mind that i've watched a bunch of his recent interviews and streams and stuff where i had seen him kind of talk about the race thing at length and if anything i wasn't doing enough in that moment to see it from the average viewer's perspective, although actually I think the average viewer seemed like they just thought it was a really great conversation. Probably, they probably did. I wasn't doing enough to view it from the Van Lathan perspective. That's and fine. I am somebody who cares about what a Van Lathan is going to think of the conversations that I have on camera. So in that sense, if I had been able to do an extra 30 or 40 minutes of that podcast and it would have made you feel like it was a more fair depiction of, of this conversation or if it would have been just much more interesting for the people out there then i definitely wish that i did that because i or i was able to do that because as much as this channel is reflective of just what i'm interested in i also want to give the people what they want that's so what, for that reason i yeah i definitely that. wish that i had dug into those topics a bit more that's fair let me drop something on you real quick because that that that's fair and once again it's your shop i don't think that there was any malice in it we talked about it you know what mm -hmm. i mean so it's like it, it it is what i'm saying but this this is sometimes what like a Van Lathan type, um, gets frustrated with. Uh, so I have all kinds of cultural um, responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. I have a cultural responsibility to protect black women. I have a cultural responsibility to consider the black community. I have not always lived up to that, right? Mm -hmm. I just you, you can't. You have to live for yourself sometimes, and sometimes you're in places that don't reflect the best version of you, you know? When I was at TMZ, uh, at first, I didn't, but after that, I sincerely tried to be a specific type of voice there. It's just difficult to do in a place that doesn't really have a, a, a cultural direction. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later, right? But what I would say is this. If I was to make my uh, media presence felt, um, my cultural presence felt in anybody else's culture, uh, if I was in a place where it was all... Italian Americans, if I was in a place where it was all Jewish people, if I was in a place, other places in the diaspora where people are black, if right now I'm doing an interview, me, Van Lathan, I'm doing an interview in uh, Kingston with dance hall artists, right? I'm not, I'm not going to be able to go into anybody else's cultural space and say, I don't really care about the responsibilities that I have to that cultural space. It doesn't exist for me. I think the the, the only people who can do that are white people, and mm -hmm. they do it, and they they do it in such a way that the line between um, participation participation and exploitation sometimes gets blurred. Right. So, like, what I'm saying is, is like, if I'm right now, if I want to go have a conversation. Uh, in a synagogue, or if I want to have a conversation even about Israeli music, if I want to have a conversation in rock, if I want to have a conversation, I have better adhere to some of the cultural rules that reflect that people. You come from the, from the punk world, right? A little bit. A little bit. You understand that that's a very dense cultural expression, and they do not accept posers, right? They do not accept posers. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, so if you go into that space, you're going to have to try in some way to relate or even consider what's going on out there. When white people come into black cultural spaces, they don't do that. They do exactly what you just said. What they do is they say, hey, you know what? I'm doing all of this and I've built my ex got me popping and this interview got me popping and you know, AD and T-Rail and all of this. But when I want to talk to Richard Spencer, none of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters now is what it is that I want to do. And that sometimes... I've always just been doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. It's just at a certain point, what I'm into or what I'm interested in, a large chunk of it, and it's the stuff that has been the stickiest and the most successful on the internet, has been the black culture adjacent stuff. And I think that... So you're interested in us, but you just don't feel like you have any responsibility to us. No, I'm interested in people and, and the music and stuff like that. My thing is, is that... But not whether or not a white supremacist is on your platform... Former. Richard Spencer's a white supremacist. I choose to take his words at face value, and I, I find it very hard to interview somebody and along the way paint a negative portrayal of them when they're sitting right there telling me who they are and what they believe. Yeah, but you did it to Ruga. No. You, you, what, what it, Ruga told you he didn't want to talk about something. Ruga told you how he wanted it something to go, and you were so interested in that part of whatever was going on that you decided that you were going to ask him Anyway, because it's what you had to get to. Again, right? I, I did the least beef-oriented interview in <laughs> Ruga's entire not, life. But understand the difference between what it is. You just said, I take somebody at face value. They say something. I'm with that. He straight up told you. Richard Spencer didn't run away from the conversation when it, I it, asked it, him about the racist stuff. Ruga didn't run away from it during the context of the conversation at all. He just later on decided that he had a very different opinion but, but of what it. But what I'm saying is... You wanted to investigate. Here's the thing. Probably a two minute conversation when I asked him about Dirk. Here's the thing. Out of an hour and something Here's long the thing. interview. The reality is, and this is okay, you're not interested in whether or not Richard Spencer is still a white supremacist. No, I was definitely interested. But once he said that he no longer thought it was a good use of his time or that he wasn't interested in that or whatever, I mean, I have to take him at face value on that. Unfortunately, it felt like the conversation kind of moved past that a little too quickly where if we had actually dwelled on that topic for an extra half hour or 45 minutes it probably would have made everybody a little bit more happy that being said the reality is is that when it comes down to serving my audience i assume that probably like 95 percent of black people who have ever watched no jumper don't even know who richard spencer is right like that conversation seemed like it was clearly a conversation that was basically for the debate world. Right. I got and Destiny sitting there. He's had conversations with Nick Fuentes a million times. He's had conversations with all Destiny's kinds of different very bright guy. extremist people or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it really, if anything, I blame you because I asked you to be on that <laughs> podcast and you turned me down because you were, you were too scared of the smoke. You didn't think that you would be able to bring it properly to old Rich. I would cut Richard Spencer in half, but that's not Rich the homie Quan, as I call him. See, you like this nigga. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, it's not even about that for me because, once again, right, I'm not a COE guy. I'm not a content over everything guy. Mm. To me, like I have fun and I do all of my things, but I care about how I'm perceived within my community because I feel like I need to be an asset to my community. There's a stature in a way that I want to be received. So you're not really going to see me going back and forth with people. If somebody has the big of a, that big of a problem, I'm in the gym three or four times a week. We can meet. We can fight. It's cool. But like I'm not going to devalue myself or devalue what I feel like my narrative is or my calling is for any types of likes of views. And I'm not accusing you of that. But what I'm saying is what I'm saying is with the Richard Spencer situation, Richard Spencer has so much work to do, so much work to do to undo the damage that he's done. Hmm. So much work to do that it's way too premature. For me to have a sit down with Richard Spencer and talk to him about that. Like it's and and when and remember, when I'm saying I would talk to racist people, I'm talking to I'm talking about ideologues. I'm talking about people who have like uh opinions crossed to me. He is somebody that actually created real damage. He was a crusader. If you want me to talk to Candace Owens or Dennis Prager or um, I mean any of those people, no problem, no issue, like no issue. But somebody that was actually to me 
not a white supremacist, but like a racial terrorist. Like to me, I don't see any. I don't see any value in that. What, what was what? What could he have done that you would think was worthy of comparing to a terrorist? Though, um, when 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 I look at the, talking about like what he's done in the past, yeah, like what what did he do that? Oh, I think the Unite the Right uh, rally was a terrorist action. But I mean, at its heart, wasn't it just a rally where a bunch of dudes were talking about what they were into? It was a rally where a bunch of guys purposely got together to intimidate and strike fear into a, a community in Charlottesville. And it was a rally that when you look at it based along based on ideological situations or ideological uh, leanings, musings, I don't know why I can't find the word, beliefs, um, to where they got together to scare people. And it turned violent. And they went out there. It's a terrorist action in the same way that I believe that January 6th, that the insurrection is a terrorist action. It's a bunch of people who came there with shit, ready to get it popping, and it got popping. So to me, like, like when I look at that, I look at all types of civil disobedience, and I see the civil disobedience. Mm. To me, the spirit and the reason why it happens matters. There have been riots in American history by all different types of people, like the Boston Tea Party, right? Like you, you look at a situation where some people go, we're not being represented in the right way. We're going to throw the fucking tea into the into the harbor, right? Mm -hmm. To me, the reason that you're doing something is key to how I view it. And the fact that they want it to people to be a, afraid of them, they wanted to strike fear into people. Yeah, I think it was a terrorist. Well, why do you say that? Why, why do you think that they wanted to strike fear into people? I'm sure if he was here right now, he would say, like, we weren't trying to intimidate anybody. We were just talking about our political beliefs. Tiki torches, they will not replace us in the way that they do. Have you seen? Have you? Have I, you? I, re I remember it. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that. Like, there are tapes from it. And there's tapes of Richard Spencer talking about that. Have you heard Richard Spencer talk about some of this stuff? Well, I read through his whole Media Matters bio. No, no, no. Or, or no, the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I found it like not the most convincing document I've ever seen that he was this racial terrorist. Right. So if there is a lot more information out there, I did my digging and I kind of had a hard time finding a lot of it. To me, the thing that is more interesting about Richard Spencer than the fact that he held this rally or whatever uh, is the fact that this is a person who was built up and magnified by the media in the run up to the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. And that then as soon as Trump was in office, he was basically erased from public life. They did everything possible to you know, make it so that he could barely even exist in the United States of America anymore. And if you go to YouTube, I mean, there are things that have happened to his identity. When you search Richard Spencer interview on YouTube, mm -hmm. it shows you all videos from four or five years ago. And then if you go to the the reverse chronological search, you can actually find conversations he's had in recent memory. So I just want to play this for everybody. I'm saying the fact that he has clearly been vanished from public life and the public sphere, to me, is the more interesting thing about Richard Spencer. And you've seen places like Media Matters and Rolling Stone try to do the same thing to me for having the gall to have, you know, unpleasant conversations. So Milo Yiannopoulos leaked... Uh, leaked... Um Milo, Neil, Neil, Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos mm -hmm. <laughs> leaked audio of Richard Spencer. And the audio that is leaked here, I just have you ever heard this? I think I might have. Right. So I'm just going to play it. I think this is where I heard it too. Charlemagne talking about it. He was out there counter protesting for two. Right. I can't remember if I actually asked him about those specific quotes or not, but yeah, he was That's, definitely on a bad one right there. <laughs> <laughs> fucking God, Adam. And so, and so, what I'm saying is, I personally think it's irresponsible. Like when, when I look, when you listen to that, mm -hmm. and if you guys want to hear it unbleeped, it's octoroons, it's monkeys, it's all of that stuff, right? 
I can't remember if the N-word is in there because most of, most of the times I hear about it. He's talking about who he rules and all of that. For me, personally, you got to prove to me that, not prove to me, you, I, before I, that, that's after Charlottesville that that's happening, right? Mm-hmm. That's after Charlottesville that that's happening. What was he reacting to? Um, he was reacting to everything that went down in Charlottesville. Do you think there's anything that gives that reaction any oxygen? I'm just like, it seemed like Charlottesville went fairly well from his perspective, right? He got all his no. buddies together and they did the big rally. Like, what, what, saying, what was he? I'm, I just, I'm confused what he was angry about. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, for that guy and particularly what he's meant, like, it, like the 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 time that he's put in, I, I him saying. Him doing an interview, him doing an interview from the framework of I'm no longer a racist. We have to talk about that. There has to be more. Mm. There has to be more that he does. But I mean, we can move off of it. It was just at a certain point, once I had already asked him about the racism thing, is that if I had said, Well, what about this one time when you called people monkeys or whatever the fuck you said he was he was using his slang or whatever? I feel like that's kind of like enclosed within the are you still racist, or why were you why, why were you drawn to this way of life? My only point, point by bringing up that video was I don't feel like you did your research thoroughly enough if you've never heard that. No, I've heard that. I just didn't bring up that specific right. quote. I mean, because I, I did that with Nick Fuentes, where uh, which by the way, AD and Flacco set up that interview, so it was kind of weird because people wanted to act like this was my idea. I jumped in between that but because you remember it's, you're the man. It's Nick Fuentes stuff. was going to go on community clips. I jumped in front of him and said, like, bro, do it on my channel so that I could be there and try to help, you know, mitigate this conversation. Because as you know, Flacco has never met a racist that he didn't like. Every 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 racist white dude on earth is somebody that Flacco has a huge amount of admiration for, He's it would young. seem. Yeah, it's it's interesting part of his uh character. But um Do you have any questions for me? Oh, I do have questions written down. Yeah. Go for it. You've just been dominating the air when we're like an hour and a half in <laughs> of you asking me shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have plenty of questions for you, for sure. Yeah. Um, if you want to just jump right into that, jump right into it. Wait, where's my? Because I've already, I've already proven you that you're in your white devil era. It's okay. It'll last for like a year. You'll be a white devil for a year, and then you'll be back. But the Richard Spencer thing is like the only like racialized part of that. Nah, right? but there's a there's a white devil energy. I think it's just a I don't give a fuck energy. It's white devil. It's, but why, what is the devil? Part? So let me let me put you like this. With a certain amount of power, uh-huh. um, with a certain if you can have a certain amount of power, and not caring, is the same thing as abuse. Oh, well, I still care for sure in that I regard. It's the reaction you that I don't, I don't care about. Well, I don't give a fuck about the fact that me living dog. my truth will inevitably offend some people. Whereas if you go back to 2017, but it's not your truth that th- there that- was an email that I sent to Milo Yiannopoulos. Where I basically said like, "Hey, check out this this uh, article," and I think it was a spin article or or some some article about two music journalists who basically had dated, and at some point there was abuse and they stopped seeing each other, whatever. And there was a ton of commentary going on at the time about whether this is real or not. And basically, like a lot of people thought the girl was lying. The dude's career was basically destroyed as a result of it. What is this? I don't remember this story. It was uh, what's his name? Ernest Wilkins. You don't oh, remember I don't know him? Who that is no. Mm. Shit, is it Wilkins? It might not be Wilkins. If there's a Ernest Wilkins who has nothing to do with this, then I'm sorry. But <laughs> it was Ernest something. And I had mentioned it in passing to Milo Yiannopoulos when I did the interview with him. And he said, like, hey, email me that because I would like to read more about that. So I sent him that email. And then at some point, Milo's email gets hacked. And BuzzFeed does an article where they said, look at hip-hop podcaster Adam22 sending Milo articles about, you know, domestic violence situations within hip hop and trying to get him to report on them. Now, this is total bullshit. I've talked to a bunch of people in the media who told me that they disagreed with the framing of that article when it came out. That was the very beginning of me realizing that the media is evil and that they, the mainstream media will do whatever lying they need to do to basically cover up or to create whatever narrative they want to take an independent content creator like me and make me look as bad as possible. Now, at that time when that article came out, this is a very distressing thing for me, for somebody to be basically saying that I was aligned with this white supremacist publicly. Now I get a whole Media Matters article, multiple Rolling Stone articles. I read them and I thought they were fair. No. You were misled. 
<laughs> by your own eyeballs. No, but I thought. I, I mean, I mean to be honest with you, I, like I think, I think, I think one white supremacist, two white supremacists. If every white supremacist, not everyone, but if if the pop popping white supremacists of the day knows that no jumper is a place where they can come and get their shit off, I think it's at least worth a conversation. We're open to conversations with whoever. There you go. And I don't think that the average hip hop consumer or the average black person wants to be tuned into media. Uh, now, how the fuck are you gonna tell me what the average black person wants? Well, it's just a guess, and I don't want to repeat my <laughs> Dame Dash conversation that I already had. How the fuck you gonna tell me what the the average black person doesn't give a fuck about? I no would jumper. say the average black. Okay, the average black person who is aware of No Jumper is probably like, you fiercely you, anti cancel like, culture. You, you have you have curated a very distinct type of audience and person the average black person doesn't give a shit fuck about what you say on no jump i don't know if i would agree with that but uh, nigga, you out your motherfucking mind every time they, i meet a black person they know happens. all about what i'm They're doing like, this is Let, like, okay <laughs> but do you think that the average black person would rather turn into like you know a highly curated censored media experience like van lathan's media diet or do you think that they would rather be involved my, my with... Media diet is, how are you going to tell me my media diet is... I, no, I, but I, you're I, not going to have a conversation with Richard Spencer. No, what I'm saying is it, I'm not going to have a conversation... I, I said already, I would have a conversation with someone who was a racist. I wouldn't have a conversation with someone that had as much skin in the game as him. If people have died behind your racism, I feel like you have restorative work to do. There's a distinction I'm making for Richard you Spencer. you setting up a, uh, you know... A, a mental obstacle course that Richard Spencer needs to complete before people like me are, should be able to have a conversation with him. I don't think that that mentality is really that popular with the average young urban person. We don't even have to make about black people. Cancel culture is extremely unpopular as far as I'm concerned. I'm determined to have who's, those conversations who's, with people that have been canceled who, who, and that are not allowed to who, have conversations. That's why I'm culture. proud, as much as I think she's a charlatan, I'm proud when I see Axe sitting down with Candace Owens. Like who, 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 because I don't think the average, you know, the Breakfast Club's not doing that. Like They're Candace shook. Owens, Candace Owens is the least canceled person one of the least canceled people in america candace, candace owens, owens would not be allowed to have a fair shake on any mainstream media outlet. okay she's so, canceled in that sense so but this is why this they is, would never document her without this, shitting on her. this is this is what i'm talking about right when we take these terms and we completely de-intellectualize them so you're talking about the fact that candace owens is a best-selling author she has a wildly popular uh, television, uh, like uh, internet show. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Candace Owens, who has no obstacle to being able to get her shit off. Who's making millions of dollars, and then you're gonna tell me she's canceled? Like, so, so, so when you when almost no mainstream left leaning media publication well, would ever, but, well, but when you give her a fair you, shake, but when you're talking, when you're talking about now, now who's talking about mental gymnastics? You're talking about one specific portion of the media. Candace Owens can go on. Yeah, the mainstream like, media. Like the she, whole is media. Fox, is Fox News mainstream media? Yeah, for sure. And so she's on there all the time. Right. So what I'm so so what I'm telling what I'm telling you right now is that like even the whole cancel culture thing, are black people um are, are ba black people good with silencing people? No, they're not, because we've been silenced too much. I'm not talking about silencing Richard Spencer. That's not what I said. What I said was if you're if you are going to have the conversation with him, interrogate what has gone on. Right. With and him. I've always said that I thought that that was a fair. Right. Point. So I'm not so I'm I'm not saying don't silence him. I'm saying for me right now, I wouldn't do it. I'm not saying that no one should do it. When you told me that you that that you wanted me to do the interview with Richard Spencer, I tell you not to do it. I told you I wasn't going to do it. Right. I'm gonna say, hey, Adam, I really don't think you should do that. I don't fuck with you if you don't. I never said that. I said the reason I'm why you shouldn't have done that conversation is the same reason why Chris Brown should not have boxed Soldier Boy. What the fuck? Just too much to lose. Oh Jesus! Because Christ. if Richard why, if Richard wins, then you're fucked. What are you talking about? I'm just saying. I don't think in I don't think of these conversations. You know, you guys. But there right? will be a winner and a loser, like, right? Like you, like you, quite often. You, you guys are you guys are so you got your head so far up your asses. Like it's like I don't think of, of these conversations in terms of winners and losers. But there probably would have been a winner I, and a loser. I think right? about how productive they are. 
Hmm. I don't think about these conversations. You really don't think you and Richard Spencer would have had a productive conversation? No, I don't. Because I don't think, I personally don't think that he wants to have the conversation that I want to have. Do you think he was intellectually dishonest in that Destiny conversation? I, I that, felt he was very forthcoming. I think that in the conversation, I could tell that he's the same guy. Really? And so for me. You don't think people can change? Of course they can. They just have to complete the Van Lathan obstacle course? It's not the Van Lathan. <laughs> that, that would be so funny. Think about if there was a Van Lathan obstacle course. I'm picturing it in my head right now. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, there's some porn in there. There's Brazzers. There's all, but, um. But no, I'm just saying for me personally, and it's like, it's a thing. So like with Richard Spencer, I don't think that I can have a conversation without litigating that with him. It's fine. But like in terms of winners and losers in this stuff, look, all of you guys are so successful. I And I enjoy watching it. I really do. Like all of you guys are so successful. All of this going back and forth, the beefing, all of that stuff, all of this winners, losers, I'm a body you, I'm a body this person. All of that's cool, right? That's fine. And, and and there's a place for that. And there's always been. If there was William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal, like going all the way back, if it was uh, no- Noam Chomsky and William F. Buckley on firing line, uh, uh, Frost, and, Frost and Nixon, even though that was an, uh, 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 an interview, it's more like a debate, when Mr. Farrakhan would show up on Donahue, um, there's always been these things that were somewhat contentious to where people want to, like extract a winner out of it right Mm. to me where i'm at right now like i've done that before and the conversations that i want to have the conversations have to be productive now in those conversations there might be disagreements but i want to translate culture to people so they have a better understanding of their world this is the thing with me i'm old enough to know now that i am not going to change the world i'm not right like, oh, you could change it, right? Right. I'm old enough to understand now that I'm probably not going not to change, gonna change it. not going to change it in its entirety. Right. But I do want to make sense of it. I want to understand, and I want my audience to understand. I want to have Vivek Ramaswamy on Higher Learning, mm. not to beat Vivek Ramaswamy. I know why. You want to ask him about his Eminem uh, performance from the other day. Come on, bro. <laughs> Come on, man. If we can agree with one thing, dog. You can't. If we can agree about one thing, bro. <laughs> But I, I just. But, wa- but the best tweet about that was somebody. <laughs> somebody quote tweeted and said, "You were lied to in school when they told you that being cool didn't matter, <laughs> because this is a clear cut example of where his campaign is certainly going to take some damage as a result of the fact that he is fundamentally uncool enough to but, have taken the stage and performed that song." But think about him now. Let's take him for example. I'm actually fascinated with him. Mm-hmm. Like I think that all of these anti woke. Uh, people that run on that type of thing. And, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy said that Juneteenth is a useless holiday. He wants to raise the voting age to 25. He wants there to be a civil service exam uh, in order to even have the right to vote. Or you have to go to the military to vote. He has a very interesting way to deal with Vladimir Putin in terms of foreign policy and to deter Putin from that. He wants out of Ukraine right away. I'm not in any way dedicated to sending more money to Ukraine or to certainly not to putting troops on the ground in Ukraine. But he has an interesting way of positioning the U.S. in terms of foreign policy uh, as it relates to China and Russia, right? All of these things I disagree with. The thing that is um, fascinating to me is that uh, he's good, and you can't deny that. He's a good speaker. He is a good speaker. He knows his messaging. He is on top of the person that he needs to be when he's inside of a room in order to be the most effective communicator that he needs to be. All I had to do was hear him talk about January 6th to make me realize that I do not take him seriously. He's not serious. He's not a serious candidate. But but he has been able to do something, in my opinion, that is pretty remarkable, which is make people look past policies that they obviously disagree with. Like, you're not going to be able to move the voting age to 25 in America. Right. He says he's going to fire uh, something like 90% of uh, – he's going to fire all the government employees. It's like 17, <laughs> 20 million jobs or yeah. something like that. He's just like, saying shit. Like, he just – you know what I mean? But they're taking him seriously. So mm-hmm. there's something there that I want to talk to for myself, and I want my audience to hear it. And I want to see if there's something that either I'm missing – or something that's to be gained. But it's not to prove that I'm smarter than him. It's not to prove that 
to anyone that I like am better or that I'm more well read, the majority of people that I want to interview are smarter than me. They're better at the thing that they do than me. If I talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson, if I talk to Kip Thorne, if I talk to any of these people, when I bring on experts on higher learning, those people are almost always more intelligent than me. Because mm -hmm. the conversation, and that doesn't mean that we always agree, um, and that also doesn't mean that I don't sometimes push them in ways that they might have might have not seen before. But what it does mean, though, what it does mean, though, is that the conversation is productive for the both of us. And not everybody has to be on that. And by the way, like, when I say all of that, it sounds lofty and all holier than out and the bullshit. I watch a lot of No Jumper because sometimes I, too, just want to hear somebody talk their motherfucking shit. But what I'm saying is when I'm in a conversation with someone, it doesn't have. it's not about winning. Mm. It's just not about winning. It's not about proving that my way is the right way because when we're talking about even the average black person, it's 40 million black people here. I can't speak for the average black person any more than you can. Well, you could imagine what an average might be like, right? I can of imagine, everyone you've ever met in your entire I life. I can speak about black people from Gardia Lane and Baton Rouge, South Baton Rouge, and other places that I've been, places around here. But I'm not going to tell you right now what a nigga from Seattle wants in his life. But what I can say, though, just on the average, if we're talking about 40 million black people. They don't know who Richard Spencer is? They don't fucking care about no jump. <laughs> They might not know who Spencer is either. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. This might be a slightly less contentious topic, but I wanted to raise it. So I'm sure you've been keeping up on what's going on with the whole Elliot Wilson situation. Just for the fans, I'll break it down a little bit, which is basically Elliot made a statement about Drake doing an interview with the little white girl who he has now unfollowed and the interview has what's been removed from the internet. We don't know, and I'm, I would really love to know. But <laughs> Elliot made a statement about Rappers going to outside of hip hop platforms to have conversations instead of, uh, you know, doing it with people who are actually really within the culture. And, you know, that stood out to a lot of people as kind of a weird statement because Drake obviously gave Rap Radar an interview a couple of years ago. Uh, apparently, Elliot has done six interviews with him in total, which I'm sure includes for, you know, print publications back in the day. And, uh, you know, Drake fired back and basically clowned Elliot for doing running gun style interviews backstage at Rolling Loud. Now, the thing that I find interesting about this is that I can't really think of another time in recent memory where an A-list rapper sort of laid the gauntlet down and said, this is what's cool and this is what's not cool in regards to people doing media. And in particular, into people doing media into their 50s in hip hop. What was your major takeaway from seeing this whole kerfuffle go down? I, I'm more interested in who Elliot thinks he is because I, I, I think maybe it's possible that Elliot doesn't realize how important he is to the hip hop ecosystem. I think it's probably more, um, I think it's, it's becoming evident to me just, you know, I fuck with Elliot, I fuck with B-Dot that Elliot is maybe looking for something mm. or he's changed it up a little bit and he's seems to be like reaching for something a little bit. And like Elliot Wilson is the highest standard of hip hop journalism that there is. Mm. And there are a lot of people out there that I consider to be on that level. I consider Sway to be on that level. I consider Big Boy to be on that level. I consider Elliot Wilson to be on that level, beat out to be on that level. When I'm talking about that, I'm talking about like a different tier of interview that you're going to get. Charlemagne in the Breakfast Club, like when you go there, um, a serious interview about relevant hip hop uh, um, topics, like an interview that when I see, okay, there's a new artist popping up and they do a rap radar interview, I'm like, okay, I'm about to really get to know them. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hear about all the other bullshit. I'm not going to hear about this. I'm about to really get to know them. And if it's an established artist and it's a Rap Radar interview, it's like I'm about to really get to know them. I'm going to know what they want for their career, musically, where they're from. We're going to get into the ins and outs really from a hip-hop perspective of that. So I just never saw Elliot as a guy that was like going back and forth with people on Twitter or doing any of that kind of stuff. I never looked at him like that. I never thought that I would see Elliot would be in something with Drake. 
I expect that from the younger cats. And it might be because we haven't appreciated what Elliot, B. Dot, and Rap Radar have meant. That's like the 60 minutes of hip hop. You know what I mean? That, that's like a real interview to the point to where, you know, they went out to like fucking Bucharest or something like that to interview Will Smith. You think about the classic joints, Drake, and he's drinking the wine with the ice in it, and you're learning stuff. Hove and all of these interviews that they've done. Griselda. Man, Rap Radar is fucking an incredible platform. But do you feel like that's the opinion of the average hip hop consumer? Because I feel like if I were to ask about Rap Radar to like a hundred people that I interview, that probably large majority aren't gonna know what it is. Why do why does he have to cater to the average hip hop consumer? Well, if you want to be a big hip hop platform, they're pretty much are, going they, to have to they're already but are. do you think it is actually like doing crazy yeah. numbers? I think that they don't upload enough to be in the same kind of realm as some of these other places because they don't do interviews um, or do the podcast like every single week mm -hmm. or every what they put interviews out in the specific but rap radar is absolutely a, a staple hip hop institution and media platform for I, sure. I feel like the only one I ever seen was the Drake one to be totally honest. So you didn't see Jay-Z? You didn't what see What year was that? So like some years ago. Some yeah, years ago, but you didn't see Griselda, you didn't see Jack Harlow, you didn't see none of these interviews? No. See what I'm saying? I mean, I interviewed all these people myself, so I'm not going to really like watch another random conversation with them unless somebody tells me that there's something important. You've interviewed Jay-Z? No, I've interviewed Griselda and or people from Griselda and Jack Harlow. Right. So I've never really like tapped in since that Drake one, which I thought was amazing. But I mean, like- It's a great interview, right? The, the weird, yeah, that was one of the best things I've ever seen. But the, the weird thing about it is that if you're Elliot, I mean, I talk about him like a goat because he of is, shit that he yeah. did in 2001. Oh, come on, man. No, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, that's, like, not, that's it, not shade. That, like, I, think, not, I feel like and whenever like, I talk about this Elliot thing, nah, people want to make it like I'm throwing it's shade. Like, it, that you, come on, bro. But like, I just told you about- The double XL editor I, I, I run know, bro, was, like, was, to me, like, the time in my life nah, where I was the dog. most tuned in to let, Elliot's- nah, bro. Nah, what, what, you're going to tell me that's not fair I, for me to have had that experience? What I'm telling you is it's not- it's not Elliot or B Dot's prerogative or or fault that you are not up on relevant hip hop interviews that have happened on rap radio. I'm not telling you how the, the world is supposed to be. I'm telling four, you what five. my experience is that's having cool, consumed but I'm their content. You that that's wrong. I'm telling it's you that, wrong for me to have I'm to telling have you a media diet. It's wrong to say that Elliot Wilson and B Dot haven't been relevant since 2001. Wow, you said that. I didn't say that. Okay, so you what just you, put words in my mouth. What did you mean by saying that? I mean that to me, the 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 reason why I talk about Elliot like he's a goat is because of his double XL editor run. Okay, cool. But what I'm telling you right now though is that the double XL uh um and this is another thing, bro. You going to talk about like you something in hip hop. You got to know, you got to do your Googles and your homework. Elliot and B dot went from from Ellie went from the double XL editor run. You're gonna act like I don't remember the rap radar blog now. Rap <laughs> blog era. Yeah, the blog That's era. That's a blog era. It's a great. Have you yeah. seen? Have you been keeping up with that? No. The blog era documentary. I've heard about it. Oh, dog, yeah. it's so good, bro. I, I miss the blog era. It's a bunch of sad stories, right? It's not a bunch of sad well, stories. Well, what, what happened to all these dudes? All these dudes had platforms early on, and nothing happened to any of them. Nah, right? it's like it's like blog era is great. Shout out to It's the Real, okay. but um. But no, you know, Ellie and B. That rap radar is 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 popping. Some of the interviews are classic. All the big artists going. I'm not in. saying that they're not. I'm just saying that for me personally, I haven't been tuned in. So to me, so I call him a legend though? because of the two the double XL run. But I think though that there's a whole audience of people that know who Elliot is from the run that they had specifically uh, when it was on title. I know that it's off title now. Is it okay? Yeah, and so it's not no longer on title. Maybe that's why I didn't see a lot of these was because, because I'm not someone who's ever downloaded title, and I don't know if there's an interview that is big enough for me to download title. So it was a title exclusive, but I think they were also with the Drake one. It was on his YouTube. Channel. It was on his YouTube channel. Right. It was on title, but then I think it went on his YouTube channel the day after, or it was on his YouTube channel and it went on title the day, whichever way. So a lot of these things, they were on title. These were title exclusive interviews from what I remember. It's not on title anymore, so things might be a little bit different now. But I, I personally think with him going back and forth, I, the thing I thought is like, why is Elliot Wilson? That's like, that's like fucking Walter Cronkite going back and forth with 
like Robert Redford or something like that. I would mm-hmm. expect somebody else to do that before I would expect Elliot Wilson to go go back and forth. And as far as doing the running gun interviews at Rolling Loud, what journalists not supposed to talk to rappers? It's more rappers there than anywhere. Go talk to the rappers where the rappers at. But I guess when people think about what a mega established hip hop media goat should be doing, they think of someone doing what Joe Budden is doing or what I'm doing or what Axe doing, where it's like you have your own studio and you get people to come to you. He does do that. Maybe though. you go do it at some studio or at you know their house or you pull up on them or whatever to do that content. But what Drake said is basically you look like Yes Jules. You run around backstage and rolling around making a fool of yourself, which I had never really seen it like that in such a black and white way. I didn't think way. of it that way either. But Although I will say that when I think about it, I haven't been to a music festival since probably 2019. And oh, why'd you stop going? Because this shit is terrible. I hate it. I've never been to one before. It's the worst, yeah. I mean, no, I, I support the people who put them on, and I support yeah, yeah, the people who it. go to it yeah. and stuff, but I personally... I have, just remember from your old vlogs and stuff like that, you used to go to them a lot. I was wondering, like... Yeah, yeah. and it's like, you know, you, you work your ass off, and sometimes you get really amazing content. Sometimes you get on somebody's bus, and you do an incredible 20-minute interview with them, and then other times you just are there, and it's like security's ushering people away as soon as they're done their set, and you're trying to, hey, Gunna, hi, Gunna, how you doing? What's the, you know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, you have your, your good... Rolling Loud backstage experiences and you have your bad Rolling Loud backstage experiences. And for me, at a certain point, it just kind of became like, well, am I going to spend all this money to go backstage and like try to make something happen? Or am I going to just stay in L.A. and just keep doing Did the, you think that that was something that Elliot shouldn't be doing? Uh, it wasn't really something that I thought of until I saw Drake say it. And then I started to think, well, this is a valid conversation about like what is cool and what's not cool when it comes to being an elder statesman in hip hop doing content. Do you think that the landscape of a certain type of media is becoming, do you think that the back and forths and all the media beefs and all the, like, I'm talking about this person and this this person, like, what's your opinion of that? Because, like, it, what it seems like to me now is that Elliot wants to jump into that pool. Mm. That he wants to be a part of that. He wants because to mix it up. The more that he's in that pool of having a Joe Budden having a conversation about him or a me or an academic, you know, he just went on Academics Podcast or whatever. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but it does feel like maybe for a while his name or the, the content that he was doing was not making as much noise because you kind of have to put yourself into these arenas so that those people – their fans will like even look at you as a potential source of content because there is so much content going on. So I think him going on an academic podcast probably is for the best because like like look at the conversation we just had where you're like offended that I wasn't as tapped into his content over the last ten years or whatever. I wasn't offended. I'm just saying 2001 is a long time ago. It's niggas in the NBA. <laughs> but they th- were born in the 2001. Thing. The thing about that 2001 <laughs> era is that they were damn near the only show in town. There was the source, and well, the then source there was WXL. Yeah, yeah, and I get it. He basically, you know, grabbed the shovel and started fucking heaping dirt on top of the source, and that was like an unbelievable experience for me to view as a uh, you know young hip hop fan. And now the landscape is very, very different. Where you know people are gonna go to Vlad even if they don't like Vlad. If Vlad has a crazy ass Boosie clip, where they're gonna the go audience. to you know, there's there's a million different people doing content, and it is a very, very different game you grew up point. listening to hip-hop a lot of hip-hop yeah you know this song mm-hmm. you know that joint but i can't remember what the fucking words are gonna be but jesus that, that beat sounds very familiar yeah yeah well what was that i'm not telling you bro you're, you're, not gonna, tell me. you're gonna go ahead and do your google let me shazam one. your voice right there <laughs> <laughs> you want to know your, shaz- your shazam is the key to what music you really like i've never used shazam before really like, oh. you know what? You, Invaluable. Can I, can I tell you something, bro? If I go to a club or a party or whatever, well, if I go to a party where they're, like, actually playing interesting music, I might Shazam 10 times. You, the parties you go to is, well, like, I don't go to parties. 15 people fucking on the floor. Oh, God. Doing down, going down the K-hole. You're about to call me porn Coke man. off the asshole. This is where one of the Riley, four jokes. Where Riley <laughs> Reed at. The parties you go to. Riley Reed's a mom now. Y'all going, I seen that. She's boring now. Y'all, 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 do, y'all got crazy masks on. Not me. It's, what it's, the fuck? it's people flipping. I know the life you live. Stop trying to act like you go to regular parties. I don't go to parties, period. Yeah, you go to all kinds of parties. No. With, 
people putting syringes between their toes. And no. I want to get mellow. Adam, let's get mellow. I would mellow. love to go to a heroin party like you're talking about, Adam, but I, let's I've get not mellow. been. You ever get mellow? Get mellow. You ever, says Adam, that? is that what they say? That's the parties you go to. You, ever, you, never, so you never get, you don't get mellow? I don't get mellow. Adam, let's get mellow. What? No, no, no. And like, what are you, like, what, what are you, 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 you don't do drugs no more. No. Yeah. You used to do a lot of drugs. Pretty good amount. <laughs> I don't know if I was ever on like thugs level, but I had I had a I had a cocaine situation in two thousand eight. Just doing a shitload of it, like just one week. It was me and one of my brothers just going crazy. And then you switched to Zempic instead. It, well, I'm on Manjaro. So oh, excuse me. Is that a designer? <laughs> um, no, uh, Manjaro is it's like an Ozempic substitute. It's like not the same. Off brand. Beep. It's like Rock and Zara. Beep. Man lose weight. Beep. That's what I do. So you love it once a week. Beep. Oh, you're not dealing with any negative consequences from it. Ah, uh, like constipation, stuff That's like it? that. Yeah, but I understand though. I'm, I mean, I'm off of it now, but I'm in the gym every day, bro. I'm lifting, PR fucking bench this morning. What was it? Two thirty-five. Nice. I could not do that. Not right PR. Now. I've lifted more in the past, but like a recent PR for sure. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, but you'd be working out. Yeah, but would you be a Mexican? No, not anymore. But you, you flipping around on the BMX bike? I, that's an amazing workout. I know that it is. Do you want to know what? really got me motivated to get in shape the other day. What? And I hope, well, I don't hope this happens to you, but if it does happen, maybe you can use it as energy and fuel. I'm getting, I'm looking good. The bro. best Fucking hate on me. weight loss motivation I ever got in my life was because when I was 21, I went on vacation with my parents and my girlfriend, and I didn't have a bathing suit. Was Bill Clinton there? I, no, he was not. That's massively overstated. But uh, <laughs> I told my mom, I said, Bring, can you bring me a bathing suit? Like my bathing suit from when I was in high school. So it's like a bathing suit. Oh that, shit! You asked your mom to bring you a bathing suit now? I, well, no. This is, Wait, you asked. I, I was twenty one, okay. and I went on vacation with my parents and my okay. girlfriend, and I didn't have a bathing suit. So I said to my mom, "Can you bring me my old bathing suit that I used to wear when I was in high school?" Now I wasn't thinking about the fact that I had probably gained like fucking 60 pounds or some shit since high school. Mm -hmm. So she brings me the, the bathing suit. I believe it was Abercrombie, if we, uh, and I believe I had shoplifted it. <laughs> and I go, and I put it on, and when I walk out to go to the pool in Florida on vacation with my parents and my girlfriend, my girlfriend and my mom both looked at me, and they both laughed their asses off because <laughs> the bathing suit was way too tight, right. and my weight loss was now impossible to ignore i went home and i got on the most serious diet and training program i had ever been like because this was my introduction to it when you're really learning what works and everything and it was you know the most weight that i had ever lost in my fucking life the other day because i've been kind of like on the edge of like like when i got home from the honeymoon i thought i was going to start dieting super hardcore like a couple months ago somehow it hasn't really happened i'm still gravitating around the same weight that i was at the other day, I don't watch YouTube shorts. I watch TikTok. But the other day, I scrolled past a YouTube short. I can't remember the name exactly. But it was basically something about, like, Adam22 has a gross body. That's nuts. Something like that was the title. It had millions of views. I click on it. <laughs> and I watch it. I'm glad that I couldn't find it right now if I tried. Obviously, people are going to probably figure it out and comment it. But I watched it. And it was basically just like a, a relatively fair analysis of my bad genetics. Oh, and so you thought it, my you body thought it was fair. I mean, it wasn't like outlandish. It's no, not we like you're saying anything though. super crazy. What we have in common, though, is that like we both. But the, the end of that story is that now I have found myself more motivated to get in shape than I've ever felt. And I believe it's because the millions of people who watch that YouTube short, it's, it's the same thing as my mom and my girlfriend laughing at Oh, me. it's the same emotion. It, it's like I, I, I can get in shape. If there is somebody who makes me feel bad about the way I look. And that's mm -hmm. why I've always wished that my girl, who was like the nicest person on earth, I wish that just one time she would tell me, you really need to get in shape if we're going to keep doing this porn thing. Yeah, but she's not going to say She that. would never say well, that. She, well, she but definitely... If she said that one time, that might be me having a Jason Love body by the end of the week. What if she said that? What if she said, you know, baby, you could look a lot more like Jason Love. Oh, <laughs> I might have to go Chris Benoit if she does that. But I'm going oh, to let the kid live. Far, I'm going to let the kid hey, live. Bro, but she going to die. She going to die, man. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, that that would be very bad. That's yeah, that would be ugly. That would be ugly. That's dark, bro. I think I said the same joke like a week ago. <laughs> That's dark, bro. Shit, man. Yeah, but I say all that to say that somehow teasing is the fuel that I need 
Some people like that. To get in shape. Some people like that. Some people don't respond well to positive shit. Like for me, when I was at my fattest and people would tease me, it only made me eat more. I would eat out of spite. I'd be like, six pieces of chicken, bitch. Really? My face, I'm a fat nigga, do whatever I want. Right. You know what I'm saying? But then like the older I get, the more, you know, my father passed away a couple of years ago. And my dad, you know, passing away was like, all right, get your shit together. You know what I mean, because he got CHF like congestive heart failure when he was in his forties. So like, right. get your shit together. You know what I'm saying? But like, you know, like we vacillate. Like we go up, we go down. You're in good shape now, though. Straight. I'm okay, yeah. but I want to get six pack level. For real. So you want to? Mm. That's in the. That's all in the kitchen. I know. And if if every time I went out to eat, if I were to like read a comment right before we sat down that was just like, "You are a fat fuck, and your body looks like shit." That might be the fuel I need to you order the grilled chicken you, sandwich. Will it help you lose or weight? Or not sandwich, salad. You know it help you lose weight? Getting mellow. Getting mellow. Getting mellow. Is that like an actual slang term it's for like shooting get up? Getting mellow. It's like getting mellow. I've never had anyone say that to me before. I, I got it from Lupe Fiasco. Really? Lupe, Lupe Fiasco said, um, remembering the feelings when they used to get mellow. Okay. Do you listen to him? No. You don't listen to Lupe Fiasco? Well, kick push. Do you think he's a good rapper? I've heard he's a good rapper. He's a great rapper. I'm not really like. Who super are the top familiar. five? The last question I'm gonna ask. Oh you. God. Who are the top five out of twenty two rappers? I want to know, nigga. Of all time. Just, just give me your top five because I never heard you talk about this. You so hip hop, but I never heard you talk about your top five. Who of top all five? time, my all time five favorite five rappers, rappers. Five rappers. It might be something like Nas, J, Tupac, Fifty, Cameron, and then we're gonna go beyond the five. I might have to throw. Thug in there because that's probably the most important rapper to me of the last like 10 years or so. I see that. And yeah, I'll probably leave it that. I know that's six, but that's it's, it's, it's a good list. I mean, it's, it's tough generic, to whittle it down, but it's, it's a good yeah, but everybody's list, list is, is generic, right? Yeah, yeah you know, but you know, but I put Cam in 50 on there, and I don't think most people do that. But I would be lying if I didn't say that my 20s damn near, but oh, and you know what? If I don't put Gucci on that list, I feel like I'm not being true to myself. Yeah, you, yeah, you jacked your whole name from Gucci, yeah. Yeah, it's Gucci situation. Look, bro. I, I I do find that a very boring conversation, though. I think the interesting is, conversation is, is like, who are the who are your personal favorite rappers? Not like who are the best rappers. My personal favorite rapper. My personal favorite rappers are the guys like the Royce Five Nines, the Lupe Fiascos, the J Electronicas. Like those are my personal. Rappers. But really, I guess the most interesting thing is like, who have you spent the most hours listening to in your life? Right. Oh, uh, good question. You know what the answer is. Because that's why I have to put Cam and 50 on it. You know what the answer is? Hmm. It's Kanye West. Oh, yeah. He's going to be up there. Yeah. That's the answer. The answer is Kanye West. I'm talking about just who I've listened to more than anyone. Either Kanye, the people I've listened to the most, Kanye West, Juvenile, and it's probably Kanye, Juvenile. Um, Those are those are by far. I, mean, I listen to 400 Degrees almost every day. You like that Juvenile Tiny Desk? It's good. That was a, jo a joyous performance. Yeah, like I, I listen to 400 Degrees and some version of 400 Degrees mm. every day, at least four or five times a week, if not Still? every day. Still? Still. Holy shit. 400 Degrees is crazy. I never dig in the crates. I never go back to the old stuff. You never go back and listen? Once in a blue, but very right. rarely. Yeah, you get mellow, though. No, what the fuck? You do, bro. Like, I feel like you're trying to like shoot up with me. You're trying to get on some Ed Buck <laughs> shit. <laughs> See? See, you keep talking about, you keep, to see what I'm saying? You keep talking, see? See? I, I'm about, I, I know we got to go out. I'm going to say something though. Do we have to go? You got to go. I, I definitely do. Oh, I got, sure, you know, okay. it's, I it's money out here to get. thought there was more time. But let me let me ask you this. Look, you know, it's cool. You're in your white devil era. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. I'm not Big 22 sure. era. Yeah, you're, you're in your, see? And now you dick riding because the big 22 thing comes from big act. Now you on active. There were many bigs before him. Like, but I'm more of a biggie small. In this, okay, um, I do think. But Ak went through the same process that I went through. He sterned down the fade with Vic Mensa, turned him into a totally different guy. He turned down the fade. Did Vic Mensa offer Ak a fade? Well, he told me, "Really, you a bitch, and I want to smack the shit out of you." Basically, to his face. You and feel now, like that's an offering for a fade? Well, I mean, it was a situation in which a lot of people felt that Ax should have attacked him on the spot, which to me seems a little crazy. But Would you have attacked him? Absolutely not. Okay. People can say whatever they want to me on camera. I'm not going to attack him. That's that's a line that I'm just not going to cross. You were down for the intellectual jousting, though. Sure, yeah. That's, that's the thing. I mean, you said that before. I do think, I'm just going to say this. 
I, I, I think that your white devil era will be over when I think it's going to be a big deal, do big numbers so it all happens, when you, T-Rail, and AD can all have a conversation and really and actually put all of this stuff behind y'all because if you look at it, but then they won't have anything to talk about. That's not true. Why are you hating? They're reaction channels. Like, like they react to no jumping. I know, but like, but why are you hating? No, don't. It, That's not hate. I'm just being real. It's no. They've reason talked to enough hate. shit about me that I feel fun, right, like it's it. okay for me to be honest about them. Go for it. Well, I'm saying though, whatever, you know in your heart that those are good guys, and they know, and they are and some of them. You know in your heart that those are good guys, and they know that the no jumper platform. Made was, them. Was, didn't make them. <laughs> See, you ain't God, white devil. That's it. Fuck it. Nah, 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 nah. nah, nah. You scared of the truth. Nah, white devil. You scared white of devil, the bro. truth, man. White, white devil. You scared of the Bruh. truth. Like, white devil. I watch. You ever see uh, uh, Ace Ventura when nature calls? Is that the first one or the That's second one? the second one. one. When they were calling him the white devil name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they stabbed him with. That's you, bro. Was that the transphobic one? Which one? Oh, they were both. The first one was transphobic. I just remember there's Shit. one where it ended with. Someone realizing that someone used to have a Finkel, dick. Or... Einhorn, Finkel. It's been Finkel. a long time. I can't even remember. It was a different world, bro. I, I always remember the scene with the sliding glass door. And he's like, ah! <laughs> Adam. Van. Appreciate you, bro. Appreciate you, dog. Good good talking to you. Always, man. I like it because Van fucks with the colonizers. He comes fucks with me. He comes fucks with Vlad. He I go... ain't scared of the squabble. <laughs> well, you don't argue with Vlad about anything, so. I don't argue with Vlad because Vlad just asks questions. Mm. You know no, but, but Vlad says what he thinks about. He says what too, he right? says stuff we mix up. Like for me, like all that stuff don't matter. But Adam, bro, be B on your big shit, twenty two. Be on your. I'm never calling you big twenty two. Be on like be on your shit, bro. I'm on my shit, man. <laughs> oh my god! All right, I'm out. Appreciate you. <laughs> we out. No jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Bow.